ho, ho, hello, sports card investors, and welcome to the final night of the virtual holiday 2021. This has been an incredible three-day event, but guys, tonight I think is the best of the three. We've got a great night in store for you tonight, including some amazing guests. We have Josh Luber the head of Fanatic's new trading card venture coming on later in the show. And he is going to give us some juicy details, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Nat Turner coming on the show to tell us about PSA's reopening plans. We've got DJ Ski. We've got great dealers from all across the country coming on and several times throughout the course of the show. It's all going to be awesome tonight. Unbelievable guests. That's just starting to name a few but then we got the giveaways. And oh, do we have giveaways tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, let me remind you the way that you enter these giveaways is by clicking on the link that is at the top of the YouTube chat right now, or you can go to sportscardinvestor.com and click on virtual 2021. And there is a link there to enter Thursday's giveaways. Go and do that now. Even if you entered last night or the night before, you have to enter again because we clear out the list every night. And let me tell you what you're playing for tonight. Things like a box of 2017 Prism Hobby Basketball. 2017 Prism Hobby Basketball. We've got 2019 Topps Chrome UEFA Champions League Soccer. That's a very expensive box. We've got Star Wars. We've got Absolute football. We're going kaboom hunting, ladies and gentlemen, or at least one of you will. We've got a contender's optic basketball. We've got, we've got, oh yes. We're ending the night, ladies and gentlemen, with an incredible break, including a box of 1996 Fleer Skybox Metal Series 2. A big box with the potential tonight for somebody to pull a Kobe Bryant or Allen Iverson rookie card worth thousands of dollars. Hopefully it will be you. What a great way to start the holiday that would be. And it is all possible thanks to our friends at eBay who have done an absolutely fabulous job of helping us put on the event over the last couple of days and donating many of these prizes. Also thanks to Tops and Panini for donating many of these prizes as well. Remember to go enter those giveaways now. The link is on the top of the YouTube chat. Speaking of Panini, we're gonna get them on now and we're gonna talk about an important topic, which is getting more kids into the sports card hobby. Because if this is gonna continue to grow and thrive, we've gotta bring the next generation in. We're gonna talk with Panini and then I'm also gonna bring on two very special guests my own two sons, Reeves and Harrison, they have started their own Card Kids channel on YouTube, and they're going to join briefly to give us their take on how we get more kids into the hobby. Promises to be fun. Let's go ahead and see if we can get Panini on. All right, so let's get Tracy from Panini on. And there he is. Tracy, <laughs> welcome to the virtual holiday. Jeff, thank you. It's uh, an honor to be back. I love I love what you guys do with this and gals and uh, I'm honored to be asked back. I was kind of shocked that I was asked to return this year, so I'm thankful. Oh, come on, Tracy. You're such a big part of everything going on in the sports card hobby. Obviously, Panini is is such a big name in the hobby and and supplies such wonderful products for all of us to talk about all the time. So we couldn't have a virtual without you. So very happy well, that I, you were on today. Well, thank you, brother. Absolutely. And what, one thing we want to talk about today to lead the show off is an important topic, which is getting more kids involved in the sports card hobby. Because one thing that I've heard from a lot of collectors over the last couple of years is as prices in the sports card hobby have escalated, it's pricing kids out of the market. And of course, I have memories of being a kid. I was a big collector as a kid. I know you were too, Tracy. And I have those memories of hopping on my bike after school in fifth grade and going down to the corner store and buying packs of cards for 99 cents. And that's not really the reality today. So how are we able now to work together to get more kids involved in the hobby? 
That's a great question, Jeff. And I just, I have to say I'm way older than you. So when I rode my bike down to the corner store to get packs, they were like 25 cents a piece. So that tells you how much older I am than, uh, than you are, but no, you're right. I mean, the, the, the whole uh, marketplace has exploded over the last two or three years. And so many parts of the business have been impacted greatly by that explosion and certainly price points for, for what you would consider kind of entry level or mainstream level products have shot through the roof. And um, the, the, the argument when it, when the, the hobby wasn't as explosive as it is now back in the day was that we, we've priced kids out of the market and that wasn't the case then. I still think there are options now for kids to get in at a, a more affordable uh, rate, but at the end of the day, you run into the situation where the kids want what mom and dad want and what they want is more expensive. And so uh, it's just something that we've had to, to adjust to and learn to deal with. I think uh, the Panini, the launching of the Panini Kids Crate program uh, around the national with a series one product was really well received, a $60 price point three uh, cereal boxes of cards inside with a bunch of cool other stuff, whether it's uh, 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 prop toys or whistles or whatever. I mean, things like that, that cater to that younger audience, still affordable, um, won't break the bank. I think that's been really well received so much so that we just launched the Series 2 version. Um, and those as well have been well received. So I think we're onto something. It took us maybe a little longer than we had hoped to get that off the ground. But now that it's running with series one, series two, I think you can expect to see us uh, uh, grow that part of our business to cater to a, a younger audience. That is a very commendable thing that Panini has done this. And I'm really excited that you guys have done it. I, you actually, last year during the virtual holiday was I think when you broke the news of the fact that Panini was working on this kids crate program. And then to see them roll out at the national this year, I actually saw some kids with them at the national. So that was pretty cool. So for people who aren't familiar, tell us a little bit more about the series two, the new series that's coming out and how kids would be able to participate and get their hands on one of these or parents possibly for their kids, whether it's for a holiday gift or for, or, or just to generally get them into collecting. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the the products from series one to series two and in future series will vary a little bit. We want to get cards in the in the in the kids crates that are uh, desirable. So it's not just a throwaway product. It's I think uh, series two had two different uh, soccer cereal boxes uh, and then a, a collegiate uh, a draft picks prism football I think in that cereal box and. Um, I think you'll see the the specific products continue to rotate and and get what's hot at the time in those kids crates. Um, and the kids crates were a direct result of this type of feedback, Jeff. That that uh, cards were were being priced above a lot of younger collectors' heads, and so it was. The, we we listened obviously and tried to um, act as uh, quickly as we could, and so. Um, ha happy that the kids crate program is finally upon us to your point i see a lot of excitement on them because like hobby shops around the country are always showcasing their big pulls and their most exp expensive products but a lot of them are showing the same level of excitement um, and coverage on the kids crate programs and that's really exciting because that's what it's about we haven't seen to this point anybody tried to gouge the price and raise it above 60 bucks i think the loudest argument or a lot of criticism we've heard is that um, that, that people 13 and older shouldn't be able to buy them. But then what that criticism fails to take into account is that a lot of moms and dads and grandmas are buying them for their kids who are 13 or younger. So, um, but you can get them through our direct uh, hobby shop accounts. And then just with series two, we started putting uh, kids crates on the, uh, the online store at PaniniAmerica.net. So a lot of hobby shops I see jumping in on the excitement and showcasing that, hey, the new cre uh, kids crates are in. I think if you do a quick social uh, search on Instagram, or you'll find a lot of different shops that you can purchase them from directly. 
Awesome. So just just in time for the holidays. So anyone who is watching who may want to go get one of these crates for their kids. This, of course, would make an incredible stocking stuffer. I'm going to have to go pick up a couple of for my kids. Uh, so it sounds like I'll be heading to one of my local card shops who's an official uh, direct Panini account um, or perhaps looking on Panini's website to pick these up. Exactly. Awesome. Very, very cool. Tracy, why is it so important, in your opinion, that we get kids involved in the sports card hobby? <sighs> Well, that's a great question. It's the future of our industry. I mean, it, it, you know, my wife is a teacher. I love teachers because they, they have such a profound influence on this next generation. And um, my wife has told me over and over and over again, when she does like reward days for her students, the most popular item are the packs or the cards I bring her to give to the kids for good grades or good behavior, so many things. And so that's grown a lot because four or five years ago, Maybe trading cards weren't her number one item among her students, but over the last two or three years, they have been. And um, it's important to keep the younger generation involved because you and I aren't going to be around for 40, 50, 60 years to kind of talk about the, the, the merits and the benefits of card collecting. And I know that there are some fifth grade kid somewhere in America is going to come up with the next great product next great innovation as it relates to retail sales or or social media and we need to make sure that those superstars turn their attention to the sports card hobby and help it sustain for generations to come yeah 100 percent. and i also think cards is a wonderful wonderful way to teach kids business finance entrepreneurship you know, I've opened up a whole bunch of businesses, but I cut my teeth on entrepreneurship. My first entrepreneurial experiences were back in fourth grade and fifth grade, flipping cards, you know, trading cards and buying and selling cards on the playground in between classes at school. Um, it is it was such a huge part of my childhood. And it, it's the way that I learned a lot about about money. I, I was a religious subscriber to the Beckett price guide back then. And every month was you know, running to the mailbox to get the new <laughs> issue to see if my cards had gone up 30 cents in value or down 10 cents in value. But I love that. And it taught me about markets and it taught me about investing and all these various things that I've carried with me for my whole life. And now I'm trying to teach my kids this as well through cards. And, and you know, we've started a new YouTube channel called Card Kids here at Sports Card Investor uh, that my kids are part of where they're opening up packs of cards and they're enjoying the sports card hobby. And I encourage that. And in fact, I'm going to have my kids on here in just a minute to share that. And it's it's such an important experience to teach them through cards. And it's also an incredible father and son or father and daughter bonding experience, a family bonding experience you can have through cards as well. No, you're absolutely right, Jeff. There's so many lessons can be learned through trading cards, whether it's geography, obviously all the business lessons and Keeping Because back when we started, like we didn't have the internet at our fingertips. So a lot of the things we learned about our favorite teams and players came directly from the backs of their cards, whether it was career stats, what they did in the off season, who their brother was, so many things that we learned by just memorizing the backs of our cards. And then to, to take it to a business extension, I mean, kids today are finding out lessons firsthand through trading cards that they might not otherwise learn until they're in college or a high level high school finance class. So no, you're right. You're dead on with all those things. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tracy, I appreciate you sharing all this great stuff with us. Let me get, out, get you out of here on this tonight. Obviously 2021 was a year of a lot of big announced changes in the sports card hobby, but in terms of 2022, what does Panini have on its radar? What are, what are, what are you looking forward to most uh, for sports cards with Panini in 2022? Man, that's a great question, Jeff. Um, you know, I just think the I'm so fascinated to see wh where it goes because the market has changed so much in the last two years. And, but it hasn't taken two years, right? It's the real uh, quick jumps in perception or public uh, awareness. I love the fact that trading cards are cool. 
maybe it's cooler, cooler than they've ever been with the main st- stream audience. I just watched a, a Milwaukee Bucks clip from their uh, post game media session, and Giannis is holding two prism cards, talking about his backup plan is to sell a lot of the cards that he has. And you never would have seen that organically like that years ago. And so I, I think you, you and I have talked about this. Uh, I, I think me and Kelly have talked about this. I think we're at the very beginning of this thing. And, and no matter how far it's ascended over the last two years, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And we've got a lot of years of, of uh, ph- phenomenal growth, excitement, product development, um, all those things are ahead of us. So to pinpoint one thing I'm excited about is hard for me to do, but I'm genuinely passionately excited to be in this business at this time and look forward to whatever comes next and hope that, that, that I am, we can be a big part of that. Awesome. Well, we hope the same Tracy. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining the virtual holiday. Hey Jeff, happy holidays to you and all of your people. You guys do a great job. You need to give Kelly a raise and that's my soapbox. I'll see you later. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no. You're leaving on that, huh? You're making, you're making my day more expensive. All right. All right. (laughs) Appreciate it, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. At Sports Card Investor, one way that we're trying to get more kids into the sports card hobby is through a new YouTube show called Card Kids that features my two sons. My name is Harrison. I do all the I do all the Pokemon on the channel. My brother does all the sports cards on the channel. Hello, my name is Reeves. On the channel, we are trying to get more kids into the hobby by opening boxes that aren't too expensive, but they're not like two dollars. Like they're still affordable, and you can still pull pretty good cards out of them. And we're trying to teach the kids to get into the hobby, just like me and Harrison. Welcome to another video of Card Kids. Oh my goodness, that is a cool Zion Williamson. Well, since this was a $30 box, and I think this Zion is a little over $30, I think I made my money back on the box. And a nice one. Wow. I am the greatest Pokemon opener at all time. Bed stone. Yes, Kyle Trask, then I'll be happy. Um, whoever that is, it's not Kyle Trask. Jalen Waddle, it's not Kyle Trask. Kyle Trask, it is Kyle Trask. Nice. The channel is a lot of fun. Go open up a new browser window right now and go to YouTube and search for Card Kids and subscribe to that channel. We'd really appreciate it. And Harrison, how else, other than just watching Card Kids, do you think kids can get into Pokemon cards more? Uh, maybe looking at Pokemon on, like, dad's phones. On <laughs> their dad's phones, yes. You watch a lot of different videos about Pokemon cards from a lot of different YouTubers, uh, YouTubers right? And that's kind of how you got into it before you started your own channel. You were watching a lot of different Pokemon YouTubers, right? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. And Reeves, how do you think more kids can get into sports cards? Um, I think... They, got, they just can go to card shows, like learn. Just at being at the card show, you learn so much. Like, even if you're going to the card show only to like buy and trade and sell cards, you're also going to the card show. Even if you don't know it, you're going to the card show for fun. Like, 
it doesn't matter if you're learning or not. Just going to the card show, you can learn so much. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Card shows are an awesome way to experience sports cards. So all you dads and moms out there listening, try to get your kids to a card show near you because it's a great way for them to experience it. And if you run into me at a card show, I might just have a little something for your kids. So make sure to please come say hi so I can give them a little something to help them get further into the sports card hobby. Does that mean you'll give me stuff? No, you I don't. Mean, you're you're, 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 you're I, ineligible. I mean, you card shows, what? Like, if I just like walk off and then walk up to you, will you give me stuff? Yes. Uh, family, family, friends, and employees of Sports Card Investor are ineligible to participate. Aww. Says it in the disclaimer language. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna go look it up. Okay. Bye. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know either. All right. Thanks, everybody. Go subscribe to Card Kids on YouTube, and uh, but of course, don't leave this stream because we got a ton of great stuff in store today for you. Yeah. Awesome. I think that was great. Good. <laughs>
National Hobby Shop Day is a GTS exclusive sales promotion event. While we have an opportunity to use it in that capacity, our customers, customers, the collectors, get an opportunity to get their hands on some really great items donated by manufacturers. What we do is we provide a bunch of incentives for um, the stores to be able to purchase uh, product selection and then are given a bunch of freebies. Those freebies include everything from promotional packs from the past, memorabilia, manufacturer contributed items from just about everybody you could possibly think of. So what that allows store owners to do is to host raffles, door prizes, contests, all sorts of stuff with the giveaways that are provided by our manufacturing and vendor partners. Okay, so this is really, really cool. So this is gonna be, it's this Saturday, and it's gonna be a festive day for sure then at hobby shops all over the country. How, how can people find a local hobby shop that is participating in this? Absolutely. You can check out facebook.com forward slash National Hobby Shop Day. A master list uh, is published there by state. And then in addition, we'll have a couple posts with some geographical breakdowns so we can be sure to tag all of our participating stores who are on Facebook. And while it's limited in its scope because of the manufacturer provided component, this year there are 150 stores participating around the country in National Hobby Shop Day this year. So hopefully everyone will be able to find one within at least a short drive. Yeah, that's awesome. So facebook.com forward slash National Hobby Shop Day. We'll find you a store in your area that is hopefully participating uh, this weekend, this Saturday. Uh, and if they are, definitely get out there. Um, Rob, what is it like putting this together? Uh, how, you know, how do, you, how do you, it seems like a lot to coordinate, right? It is a lot to coordinate. Um, my job on this project starts way back uh, in the beginning of the first quarter, really, as we start having conversations with our manufacturing and vendor partners to be, have it on their radar again, you know, as they're working with budgets and whatnot. And because obviously, you know, there's an expense involved for them and we want to be sure that they can participate and contribute. So the process with the dialogue starts way back, you know, almost 10, 11 months ago. And then ramps up as things get closer, whether that be advertising on social and in Beckett and on various websites like Cardboard Connection and Sports Collectors Digest, to app actually then getting all the incentive items out to our customers before the event, as well as, you know, things like window clings and point of sale reminder cards, things that they can use to help promote the event at their the store level as well. That's awesome. That's really cool. And this year, I suspect it might take on a little bit of a special meaning. You know, we're just kind of coming out of COVID-19, kind of, sort of. But, you know, a lot of these hobby shops may not have been open last year for in-person visits. This year, they, they most of them are open for in-person visits. So what do you think that's going to be like? And, and what can people expect maybe when they arrive to these participating hobby shops on Saturday? Well, really, it's going to depend on what the store owners decide to do. And we give them, obviously, some direction and some ideas. But as far as what the experience is going to be, it could be different at every different shop. But I guarantee you that there will be lots of opportunities to win prizes. There will be refreshments. We provide a uh, refreshment credit to their account so that they can buy, whether your customers are pizza and beer people or, you know, martinis and shrimp cocktails, or depending on the kind of store you're running. So we like to be able to provide that. And you brought up a great point. We did have to suspend National Hobby Shop Day last year, just knowing that you know, a number of stores that would want to participate simply wouldn't be able to, or be able to participate with it so scaled down that it just was going to lose its significance. So much like everybody else, we're so glad to get back to in-person events and our customers are super excited to have this opportunity to share this special day with their customers. Awesome. And we are super excited that GTS has helped organize this. 
Uh, and you. hopefully a lot of our viewers are excited and they'll be able to get out there this Saturday to local hobby shops participating. All right. So once again, facebook.com forward slash national hobby shop day to find a hobby shop near you. Rob, thank you so much for joining the virtual holiday. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Take care. All right, everybody, we're about one hour away from announcing our first set of giveaway winners tonight of some huge prizes we're giving away tonight. If you haven't yet entered the giveaway, the link is on the top of the YouTube chat, or you can go to sportscardinvestor.com, click on virtual 2021, and then click to enter the giveaway from there. You have to enter fresh every single night. So even if you did it last night, go do it again now. Also, if you want to check out Market Movers, you just saw that cool commercial, promo code virtual, will get you 20% off your first payment month or year for market movers using promo code virtual. All right, we are about to bring on a very special group of people. You've seen a, a few of them already this week, uh, and, and you're gonna get some new faces as well. These are some of the best sports card shop owners from around the country. And they're gonna come on to talk to me about the future of card shops and what they think is ahead for the sports card market. It's gonna be a great conversation. Let's get them on. All right, guys, we have an incredible group of people we are bringing on now. These are some of the very top card shop owners in the entire country, in the entire world. An amazing group of individuals. Let's bring them on to get their perspective about the sports card hobby and where things are going because there is no greater group to tell us about that than these fine folks. Let's first bring on Joe Davis from GotBaseballCards.com. Joe's a familiar face. Have you been watching you know, this virtual or previous virtuals or just about any content on this channel? You've seen Joe time and time again. And Joe, tell everybody uh, about your shop. Uh, Jeff, it's great to be with you. Yeah, I'm Joe Davis with GotBaseballCards.com. We're located in Loganville, Georgia. I've uh, been happy to get to be a part of this hobby for over 30 years now. Uh, we do, do our best to serve customers both locally and globally, uh, whether it's, you know, grading cards with us or whether it's uh, ordering new wax or consigning cards, whatever. We try to be a, a full service, one-stop shop for all sports and offer trade nights and lots of fun stuff like that for, for young collectors. Yeah, for sure. And in fact, we've got a great uh, bulk grading program that, that we do here at Sports Card Investor with Joe. If you're interested in getting your cards graded by any of the companies, any of the major companies, uh, we've got a great deal with Joe to get you discounts on that. You go to sportscardinvestor.com and click on grading in the main menu bar to find out about that. Awesome, Joe. Welcome back to the virtual. We're happy to have you. Great to be here. Awesome. And let's bring on the card father. Let's bring on Rob from Burbank Sports Cards. Rob, you are one of the originals in the, in the card shop world, and, and you've got an incredible card shop, a card shop that some regard as one of the greatest card shops in the world out there at Burbank. Tell, tell everybody about yourself. Um, let's see here. I started working in a coin and stamp shop in 1979. I've owned the business outright since 1989. Um, just love cards we've got two facilities one is our retail showroom it's got 33 showcases it's ultra organized it's brand new we just moved here in july we've also got a 7500 foot facility next door that houses over 40 million cards that are accessible online 40 million cards absolutely incredible and do you inventory those one by one yes yes we do we have minions uh no but <laughs> 
we have them in a database and uh, it's literally the whole buildings on eBay over there. We got two and a half million different listings on eBay. So I keep a team of guys quite busy. Unbelievable. That's amazing. All right. Well, let's go to the middle of the country. Let's go to Columbus, Ohio, and let's go to Ryan from Card Collector 2. Ryan, welcome back to the virtual. It's good to see you again. Yeah, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And tell everybody about your shop. Yeah, so we uh, we are located in Grove City, Ohio, about 15 minutes south of Columbus. And while we have not been open as long, uh, nearly as long as these two fine gentlemen have, we're, uh, we're certainly hoping to be around as long as they have. Um, so we've only been open for about two and a half years. But again, like both of these guys, we offer a wide variety of singles, wax, grading, all sorts of different things. Awesome. Well, welcome back, Ryan. You guys do a fantastic job there. Card Collector 2. And now let's go to a new store, a newer store that, that has received all kinds of attention because of a prominent location and absolutely wonderful trade nights that they put together. Uh, Bleaker Trading in New York City. Welcome, Mark, to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This is exciting. Absolutely. And tell everybody about your shop. Uh, as you mentioned, new store um, based in West Village, New York City. Really, during the pandemic, didn't have a place to congregate for the hobby for cards. Um, New York just doesn't have that kind of welcoming rent. So we jumped into it. We're able to put our spin on what we think of as more of a modern hobby shop. Uh, we have what we call fun to find wax. Um, everything from your skybox basketball in the 90s to things that you can access today up into your NTs and your flawlesses. Uh, we do focus on a lot of merchandise, a lot of exclusive um, collabs that we'll do with different artists or different um, project folks like Ski, Natural. Uh, we get to work with brands like Activision and Hulu to do events and kind of bring a little bit more culture into the hobby and kind of recognize, I think, the growth that's happening here. And recently, I think what we're most proud of is we have the largest collection of Type 1 photos on display in New York City, something that I jumped into after the National. It's been a big passion of mine. That's awesome. And uh, you made me tremendously jealous, Mark. We had Laura Don Diego from Don Diego Trading on last night. And of course, I have seen that incredible, you know, storefront design you did with her in New York City. Um, and uh, she's beaming ear to ear about that still. That was, that was amazing. I'm sure that was a wonderful trade night you guys did. It was. I mean, you got to give Laura credit. Um, our window has been iconic. It started with Babe Ruth and Ski. Then we went into Derek Jeter, Michael Jordan, and now Laura. So, um, you know, it's been really cool. I did I did promise Tyler, though, if we can figure out a way to get Ryan and his wife to New York, we would consider maybe something a little bit more iconic on Bleecker Street. So, you know, just something to think about in the future. <laughs> Okay, right. So, so this is the offer right now to, to card collector Ryan here? I mean, it's hard to get through Lou and Tyler. So when Kelly made the offer to come be near him, I thought, you know, hey, I met John in L.A. a few months back. He made it clear uh, he's not coming to the East Coast anytime soon. But, um, you know, Ryan's like very high on our radar, someone we want to uh, show New York to. So something very exciting. All right. Well, if you, if you, get, if you get Ryan out there and you're going to paint that storefront again, please feature Ryan's wife. She's much prettier than Ryan is. That would be my recommendation if you want to pull people into the shop. You know, you know, good people like Adam Lefko have hinted to us that's the key. So, uh, you know, yes. we're, we're trying to follow the experts. We can't get you out there, Jeff. So, you know, we'll, we'll hang tight for now. I will be up there someday. I will definitely be up there someday. But I will not, I will not ask you to paint me on the storefront. We can, we, can, <laughs> we, can, we can have Kelly from my team here on the storefront in, instead. It will, it will I don't know. With those, people. with those suspenders, it may be worth it. We'll see. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining, Mark. And then we have Jimmy from Awesome Sports. And Jimmy is a amazing wax dealer who has one of the most ridiculous wax collections you will have ever, ever seen. And Jimmy, you were on this virtual a, a year ago, I, I think last summer. And I remember uh, during it, you were showing off a lot of your higher end boxes. You had, you had exquisite 2003 exquisite sealed boxes. Um, that you were showing off during that broadcast. And I shudder now to think about the prices you were quoting on those boxes that night. And the fact that I did not buy any of them that night from you, because I now see those same boxes going on golden auctions and eBay and all of these other, you know, areas for, for 10 X, you know, what you were offering them for here on this show uh, just over a year ago. It's, it's absolutely incredible, the growth in wax. 
Yeah, um, yeah, that was exquisite. I think I, at the time I had like five cases, and then I think that at the time it was like a hundred, two hundred thousand. Uh, we sold um, pretty much all of it, and then I think the golden auction they recently sold one for like ten, I mean one million dollar or something like that. So I'm pretty dumb by uh, their their price point, but um, yeah, um, my name is Jimmy. Um, I own Awesome Sports, and then we are strictly online. We specialize in only unopened uh, box and cases. And I've been in the hobby for about 30 years and then start as a collector in high school. And then I had actually retail store in early nineties uh, while I was going to college. And I started as a, uh, just a started retail shop and then being on and off as a just investor, buying a lot of unopened product for, you know, close to 30 years. And then um, last year I saw the, that opportunity that how our industry changed dramatically. And I decided, okay, you know, we, um, you know, decided just to build the online uh, platform since we had uh, just, you know, a lot of rare unopened product that I decided to just open, um, I just named the, my first son's name Awesome and then just created Awesome Sports. And then uh, we are going to year two and then I've uh, been just, just overwhelming uh, fun and, you know, excitement, how industry has been changing, um, just seen from 30 years ago to, you know, last two years, basically. And you, before we get into the group discussion, you put together an incredible card show, card expo, global collectors expo, you're calling it in Las Vegas in March of next year. And this thing is going to be ridiculous. You told me some of your plans. Tell the audience a little bit about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I just kind of, as our industry grow, um, I, I just kind of feel like we definitely need uh, some um, just um, our tr trade show can, should be more like a tool to a lot of these new partners. I feel like we need to uh, just up the um, just the quality of uh, a trade show. So we um, year ago, like uh, uh, early this year, I signed up contract with the MGM. And then we are actually uh, putting a show at the Mandalay Bay Convention Center, um, 300,000 square foot. And then um, last month, we secured the, actually a uh, contract with the uh, uh, Allegiant Stadium, which is a, that's a new Raiders football stadium. So we're re renting out the whole thing for after party. And then, um, you know, we're, we're just basically um, just want to give all this uh, new collector different experience. So we, it, it's not, it shouldn't be more buy, sell, just like kind of Swami Billy. I just kind of feel like a, a trade show, show should be just a tool of information and then just support uh, uh, industry. So I, I want to just build a different experience than tr traditional trade show. So we're, we're, we're going to have a, uh, just a complete different um, experience um, by, just opening this uh, stadium experience. And then we're gonna actually also offer um, this, uh, not only just a face-to-face -face transaction, we also gonna have uh, this uh, virtual um, format where people that who couldn't make a trade show, they still can um, to come to our online, uh, the, the virtual platform, so they can still do the transaction with the people who set up for the show, basically. Yeah, this is going to be an incredible show. I, I'm super excited. When you, when you told me that we could hang out on the field of Allegiant Stadium and, and uh, maybe kick field goals on the Raiders goalposts, I was like, okay, this is a card show I'm definitely coming to. So that is, uh, what are the dates, Jimmy, in March? Oh, uh, yeah, it's right before March in Madness. So it's going to be March 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, and then we already, I know that hotel rooms are going to be just expensive. So we're, we already... A reserve of 4,400 rooms um, reserved. And just we planned out this throughout the entire uh, this year. Um, so like just Wi Fi, so we, we solved the problem with the Wi Fi and just, 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 just we really detailed it out and then um, on, the, on the where, where so we can give a completely different experience, a show experience. Um, hopefully, then we can have a just have a good time, basically. Awesome. Well, very much looking forward to that. Awesome, guys. Well, this is obviously a powerhouse panel. I would love to hear from you guys what this year has been like, because 
you know, what a, what, a, what a crazy year for the sports card hobby. Things were red hot at the beginning of the year. Then things kind of cooled off quite a bit. If you're looking at at least secondary market prices, that may not be the case with what you guys have seen in your stores and, and customer transactions and everything. Recently, we've seen prices in some parts of the hobby really start to pick back up again. Other areas remain a little bit soft, but I'm curious to see in your card shops what you are seeing kind of going on, how this year has been for you. Um, Joe, let's start with you. It's been a fantastic year as a whole. Uh, you're correct. I mean, I see things on the in, you know, uh, as an insider in the industry as well. And you know, when people were panicking after we saw the dip, you know, after the the start of the year was phenomenal, and then we kind of saw that dip, and then uh, a lot of people are like, "Oh no, it's, you know, the the run's over, things are tanking." And I was like, "Just hold on, you know, there's plenty of new people still pouring into our stores." Uh, you know, online auctions are still strong and so forth. Then we saw things rebound pretty quickly. So in the store, uh, we are seeing more new faces than ever. Seems like every week we're still hearing those stories about, hey, I got out of it in the 80s or 90s and I'm back, or now I'm getting my kids into it. Uh, we've heard those stories so many times over the last year. It's great to see uh, older collectors coming back and new collectors coming in. Uh, and what's great is it's not just people looking for a quick buck. It's a lot of people who are just really passionate about collecting and just loving the hobby for what it's all, you know, they, they want to collect their favorite team or their favorite player, or they love, you know, XYZ product and they want to buy that every year. And, and so it's, it's very exciting. It's been very refreshing for me <clears throat> to see all the new faces, see, uh, older collect. I mean, sometimes I've seen customers I haven't seen in 20 years and now they're back in the store again. So it's been, it's been a phenomenal year and I, I expect uh, even greater things in the year to come. That's great. That's great to hear. How about, how about you, Rob? How has the year been for Burbank? Uh, it's been, if you would have told me back in December 31st of last year, what I had in store for 2021, I wouldn't believe you. Um, literally we had lines out our door consistently all year at our old location. With COVID, we simply couldn't pack the showroom. We could only keep maybe 10, 11 people in at a time. And I'm sitting there as a retailer, sitting there telling people, you know, you've been in here 20 to 30 minutes. I've got to rotate you out to get someone else in. In what world do you even say those words? It's absolutely crazy. And we could be 25, 30 deep, people looking to get in, knowing ahead of time that we have that line. They were so passionate about visiting us, they would wait in that line, which is absolutely crazy. So we were faced with, what are we gonna do about this? Well, our building, you heard how many cards we own and the thought of moving everything just wasn't an option. There was just no way in hell I was gonna move 40 million cards. Then this building came up about a block from us, literally. It was about 4,000 feet, literally you could walk back and forth and. We decide, you know what, we're going to take the leap. We're going to separate the business into an online center and a retail center and just reimagine what a card shop's supposed to look like. And just things that used to be in the past don't need to be in this store if it doesn't make sense. And it's been, it could be a Thursday at three in the afternoon and we could just be crazy in here, just the sheer amount of people. Um, the distances they're traveling from are it just blows my mind. People driving three hours to get here consistently once a week. We got guys in here six times a week. Like no joke, because they need to see what new merchandise we put out because we're rotating things constantly. But it's not, you know, every, there's sexy cards. Don't get me wrong. We've got them. And I think at the core, we're a hobby shop. We have a room called the fishbowl that we built that was specifically built for this building. It's got 600 double shoes that are color coded by sport and has about 280 different names. So as a hobbyist, you can walk in our store and you're looking for Clayton Kershaw cards. Cool. Pull down that double shoot. Dollar, dollar and a half, dollar, two dollars. Sit in the room. Super comfortable. Has its own television. And we are trying to be everything to everybody. Um, that includes price points. Being very adamant about that. And it's just, I was here 14 hours yesterday and I love it, but the place is absolutely exhausting at times, but it's a good exhausting and just a lot of first world problems. But when people walk in here and the funny thing, and Joe will allude to this as well, there's so many new customers 
-hmm. We haven't been here six months yet, but I would say 70% of the people that come in here aren't aware that we had a store before this. They've been here first time in the last six months. And the funniest thing is, I don't even know what their full faces look like because so many of these customers are so new from the last 18 months, six months, whatever, we've had mask mandates the whole time. So it's just kind of funny that I don't even know what these people's faces look like, but they're in all the time. So incredibly exciting. And we'll talk further. It's just getting warmed up. It's simply just getting warmed up for everybody. That's, awesome. that's great to hear. And that, I love hearing about all the new people continuing to come in. That's great. Ryan, what are you seeing? Are you seeing still a lot of traffic from new people? I know you've also got a lot of kids who come to your store for your kids trade night and everything like that. <clears throat> Yeah, we've definitely seen we've definitely seen a lot of that, a lot of a uh, lot of younger collectors getting into it, which is great, right? Got to definitely have somebody to, to pass it on to and encourage uh, really the next generation of card collector. Um, I I would resonate, you know, you know, uh, just resonate with what those guys said where it's just it's really been wild, right? So it started off the year was really the first three months of the year. It didn't seem like it, no matter what we purchased, it, it wouldn't go up. It just everything was really really hot. They have a little bit of a cool off right around the time PSA closes. Um, and I think that's one thing we've really learned a lot this year um, is to really focus on like multiple streams of revenue because PSA grading was such a big part of our business. And then when that goes away so abruptly, it just, it really changed things and put a lot of things into perspective for us. Um, so that really opened a lot of a uh, lot of eyes for us this year. Um, but again, we've really started focusing more like with that, we've started focusing a lot more on content creation, right? Trying to, really replicate what Rob and his team have been able to build out there in Burbank, right? Like trying to be everybody to everybody, but in the same time also being nationally and globally known, right? I mean, if you ask anybody that I know in cards, what the number one card store in America, that's probably the number one answer at this point, right? I want to be like that. That's what we're trying to build, right? I don't know if I want 40 million cards online, but I would love to be able to, you know, we have people that travel three hours or six hours. Like I want to kind of replicate that, that same kind of thing and what a lot of these guys have done. So um, that's one thing is just really focused a lot on, you know, content creation, growth, and then just continuing to, to build every day. Awesome. Awesome. And Mark, you launched your store into a pandemic environment, right? And, and of course, your, the whole design of your store was for it to be like a social type experience. What has that been like for you and how have you kind of overcome that? Yeah, so we went into it um, knowing we wouldn't have access to sealed wax. Um, no relationships with distributors, no even understanding of how to get it. So the idea of opening a social club was really the, the best idea um, and really was trying to figure out a couple of things. One is, what does New York City really need from the hobby? Um, growing up in and around the New York City music scene, we had a store called Fat Beats. It's where you went to find and discover music. You maybe didn't spend a lot of money. But anything cultural that happened in music uh, went down in Fat Beats. And so we tried to replicate that a little bit with the merch, with the events, uh, kind of with a little bit of that exclusive by appointment only feel. Um, it took off in a good way where over the summer we did get access to GTS to give us, um, bring us on. And what we didn't know what that was or wasn't, we thought we like hit the Holy Grail when we got that call. Little did we know we just, you know, sold out to the mob. Um, and no one likes me calling, uh, you know, Carvin a Fenucci, the black hand, but, you know, that's kind of the world we're in. So, you know, after my first 12 shipments of Sage football, um, you know, frankly, you know, Jimmy, I don't know if you know this, but like we've done a handful of transactions with you. Um, some of the 2012 Prism, some of the LeBron Tops Chrome boxes. And those were the early days, Jeff, where Nat Turner would come by and just, to, you know, he's putting up posts. Where do I buy cards in New York? And someone recommended Bleaker. He came by. And one of the things we had was, you know, one of those 2012 prison boxes. And when he had put that up online, it got a little bit of people wanting to come down. And so we're still figuring out kind of, you know, how we play in the, in the sealed wax world. We're doing very well in the, pri in the private trading and selling. I think what we've seen over the last year that's been different is um, a lot of investors are just burned. They came in a little too late, got caught up in the hype. And they just want to know what to do with all this. Um, we're not really here for those folks. Um, you know, I think it's interesting if they want to sell their cards at a 60, 70% discount. Um, that's a different story. There's a lot of buyers for that. What we're getting, though, is a lot of those guys saying, hey, 
I bought in, didn't make the best decisions, but I love what I'm doing. And now I'm reading and I'm learning and I want to trade up. I want to take all these slabs of modern and maybe get one great card or maybe take some of this modern and get it to some vintage. But this is the hobby I want to kind of have. I like the community that's coming and I want to stay in it. And so a lot of what we've tried to figure out is how do we bring that community together? I think when you look at our trade nights, we start seeing a lot of those people we see on Instagram every day. And we're like, oh, my God, this is kind of Instagram in real life. Um, from that standpoint, though, until we really get um, a flexible strategy to buy affordable wax, I think what we're trying to do is go outside the box as well. Go to events, um, take advantage of what New York really does offer to an LCS, which a lot of cities don't. Like we mentioned, able to work with brands like Activision and Call of Duty on the release of their new game bring an art component and a collectible component to it where they gave us art prints. We said, well, let's bring our part of the hobby to it and at least get them numbered. Um, and then, you know, work with every trade night we do. We have a print, um, went from making those prints to making those collectible prints to now ski signed his last round of prints and PSA actually slabbed them. Um, so coming up with other ways to do things, talking to some of the, um, other brands, um, not the uh, not the card companies, not the Upper Decks and the Paninis who should be helping us. Um, yeah. Instead of Upper Deck telling me because I don't have a landline, they won't sell to me. They can't prove I'm a card store. But talking to the Goldens and the Heritages and even the Alts, the people that have, let's call it beyond Series A, Series B, and saying how can we become collaborative to kind of keep this vibe going, keep some cool factor into the hobby. And, you know, Ron, you bring up a good point. We get people traveling from all over to our trade nights, and it blows my mind. Um, you know, it's they come from the Catskills. They come from Pennsylvania, three, four, five hours. And I think what I would love to do is hope that between all the people on this panel and the like-minded ones that aren't, is that you kind of set the example for the future LCSs. So no one has to travel five hours. But when I go to Chicago and I put up a post like, hey, where do I go? I'm overwhelmed with responses versus locals being like, nowhere really to come here, but I hope to make it to New York one day. Um, so yeah, I think that those, those are kind of the big elements are people trading up to get to either vintage or to stay into the hobby, um, you know, trying to really build community and then, you know, bringing, figuring out what New York stamp will be on the hobby and then figuring out other ways for an LCS to make money beside until let's say fanatics, uh, you know, makes life a little bit easier or, uh, takes out Fanucci in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you guys about that next, but, um, first I want to hear from Jimmy. Uh, you know, you've been in the hobby, Jimmy, for so long, uh, and have had this incredible wax collection for so long. What has your perspective been on, on how things have escalated over the last year or how things have been over the last year? <clears throat> so, so I guess, uh, um, there's a, we can separate like a more 2020 versus 2021 where 2020 nearly i had to like just people uh, on the phone online like just asking for product to where this year one thing i noticed is um they're becoming very selective of um what they want to buy um i think just a main reason is it just uh, it, it's just we're going through session of like a growing pain. That's kind of what I, uh, I, I, I would look at it because uh, 2020 has been incredible year for everybody because of a, with the pandemic, people just isol isolated and then uh, just our, uh, just collecting any collectible industry just uh, uh, took, took like an X times a 10 um, to, to grow that much further. Then um 2021 comes and then everything kind of start to settle down and then where everybody's starting to make adjustment uh starting with the, a lot of these psa and bgs such as grading company and then where they shut it down and they 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 adjust the pricing and then they try to like regroup themselves while that happening then obviously a lot of retail product and a lot of uh product that has a lot of regular base card they that's become like ungradable. So uh, that actually result to uh, uh, people to be more selective and then here toward the hit and miss the type product like a flawless and national treasure. And then things, uh, product like a prism and uh, select uh, become uh, less popular. But I feel like this is a more like a short term um, where even though there's a lot of people panicking 
uh, the, the, the compared to 2020. I, I just think that this is like a year of a growing pain, a lot of adjustment uh, it's, it's making on the 2021 in, in short time. But I think when 2022, 2023 comes, and I just feel like things are going to get adjusted and it's going to be uh, stabilized. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to hear about the optimism for the future for sure. All right, guys, this has been awesome. Let me get you out of here on this. I want to hear one prediction for the next year, one prediction for 2022. It can be related to the card industry or heck, it can be, any, it can be anything else. Maybe Ryan's going to tell me that Ohio State's going to somehow make it back to the playoffs next year, even though I don't believe it. Um, but give me one prediction for 2022, but you got to give it to me in one sentence or less. One sentence. Joe, I'm going to start with you. One prediction for 2022. Lots more growth, but consolidation on the top end of the industry. Interesting. Very much. Very good. I like that. How about you, Rob? An incredible amount of content will be hitting the mainstream airwaves. Hmm. I like that as well. And I think that that is true for sure. Uh, that's going to help things. How about you, Ryan? Um, huge growth in fringe sports markets like soccer, UFC, F1, and others. Yeah. And we're already starting to see that for sure. We've seen a lot of that this year, but, but uh, you're definitely bullish on that continuing. That's awesome to hear. Uh, Mark, how about you? Uh, live, live experiences uh, will reach an all-time high for this hobby. And that's a good one to lead into Jimmy because he's, he's behind one of those live experiences. Jimmy, one prediction from you. It will be huge transition change year. 2020 will be. There you go. Awesome, guys. This has been a pleasure. It's an honor to have so many esteemed uh, shop owners in, in our hobby on uh, all together. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for joining the Virtual Sports Card Con, and good luck. Best of luck to all of you guys in 2022 and beyond. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Absolutely. Hey, Parker, don't forget, 400,000 cards in market yeah, orders I know. by Christmas. I know. <sighs> One. The Sports Card Investor app has received an update in the Apple App Store earlier this week. If you haven't gotten the updated version yet, you can now track sealed wax. Hundreds and hundreds of boxes of sealed wax are available for you to track and shop in the Sports Card Investor app. It also now has a free form search and an awesome ability to share charts directly to social or via text message. However you want to share them via email, you can now do that all from the Sports Card Investor app. Make sure you have the latest update, it's free. Or if you do not yet have the Sports Card Investor app, download it on your phone now. These updates are available right now for Apple users, Android users. You should get your updates next week for all of those great new features. One more announcement. You see these beautiful paintings behind me, the Jordan, the LeBron, there's a Kobe over there as well. 
These are all from JGeeker Studio, and we have a special deal going on right now just for the virtual 20% off. A 20% discount on this beautiful art if you'd like to hang it in your home, available in different sizes. To find out more, go to sportscardinvestor.com and go to shop in the main menu bar and then go down to art. A 20% discount will automatically be applied to your shopping cart. There is no promo code needed. Just add art to your shopping cart and a 20% discount will be applied. That's on sportscardinvestor.com underneath shop in the main menu bar. Okay, we got another great guest that we're about to bring on. We are going to take a look a little bit beyond sports cards and find out what is happening in the world of trading card games and magic. Let's bring on our next guest. All right, guys, we're going to get Daniel Chang from Vintage Magic in here. This conversation is going to be very worth your time because while sports cards have been red hot, other areas of trading card games have as well. There's some investment opportunities abound, so I want to give you perspective from one of the experts in that space. Let's bring Daniel up here. And Daniel, welcome to the virtual holiday. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for joining. And, and you're an interesting guest to have here because I understand you actually started in sports cards many, many years ago. But what you do now is really focused on the Magic the Gathering space. Tell us how you started and tell us about that transition. Well, I, you know, I was uh, started when I was 19 years old. Um, well, I started collecting since fifth grade, but 19 years old, uh, I was studying mechanical engineer, engineering in uh, uh, University of Washington. And uh, I started this sports car consignment brokering business with a business partner. And we, you know, did some shows like at the National. I remember when BGS first started out their company. Um, I think it was, I forget the exact year, but when they first started, I remember reviewing cars, trying to get a BGS 9.5 and it was, it's always been a love. I've always collected cards and sports and love Ken Griffey Jr. And uh, those guys, you know, in the Seattle area, because I'm from there. So, yeah, I just, I, I always, I, I grew up loving sports cards, grading cards, uh, you know, in the hobby. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So cut your teal in sports cards. But tell me what you do today with Vintage Magic. Yeah, so what I do today is we're pretty much, um, uh a world leader in the older vintage cards. Um, I focus on uh, primarily what I call the reserve list cards or power nine or old school magic cards. Um, they're basically the era from 1993 to 1994. And uh, the most famous card a lot of you guys may have known is the Black Lotus. It's kind of like our Michael Jordan, uh, you know, card. And um, we sell anywhere from you know, it could be set collector cards. People uh, can play play with cards, or they can be high end graded cards. It can be a wide range of cards. And very unique for us, we also sell uh, artwork and prints and collectibles like that. So, Magic is very different because uh, compared to sports cards, uh, the artwork and the artists are a huge part of the game. Yeah, that's that's it's definitely interesting. And when you talk vintage, it's interesting. You're vintage magic, but you know, for you, vintage is the 1990s. When you know, when sports collectors think of vintage, we often think about like the pre-war era or like the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, magic's term, you know, its life has been a little bit shorter than that. So, I guess tell us about how kind of magic originated and why the cards that you concentrate on are so valuable and sought after today? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, Magic the Gathering is the, the originator of all the gaming collectible cards. So it was invented by um, a gentleman named Richard Garfield uh, back in the early 90s, and they created a company with uh, Peter Atkinson, the CEO, and they started a collectible card game. So basically the first game where you would play with a card and the, the pictures and everything, you would, you know, battle each other. And Magic's really simple. You can look it up. Uh, you know, it's simple, but also complex, very complex. You know, people look at it as kind of like chess and also a combination of poker. You know, highly skilled, but also, you know, uh, some luck involved. So, um, yeah, so basically, you know, this game evolved. 
uh, sold to Hasbro, I believe, in 1999 for almost $300 million. And then now it's become, I believe, Wizards of the Coast is the parent company uh, or, or the company that was sold to Hasbro. And I think it's one of Hasbro or if not Hasbro's most profitable uh, growing space. So they now have Magic Arena, um, MTG Arena. They have online you know, gaming and such. It's kind of like almost like an eSport format um, in a way like Hearthstone. They've gone that way. Um, I think they're even launching like a Magic the Gathering movie later on with Netflix. So there's lots of great news going on in that space. So, but for me, the old, the vintage era, you know, it's pretty funny you say that because the vintage cards and collectibles have now become that nostalgic thing for all of us, right? Just like I have these Super, uh, Super Mario Brothers, the Transformers stuff that I collected when I was young. These are actually my kids. But, um, you know, I still today walk into Target and buy, you know, some Transformers, right? And I still feel that, you know, like, hey, you know, I can hang out with my kids and play, you know, some Transformers the same way Magic is today for adults. But these cards are very unique. They're not just, uh, you know, you know, you're, it's not just only collectible, but it's also a game people play. And at the high level, these expensive level cards, these decks can be anywhere from, you know, 50, 100,000 to almost a million dollars a deck. Wow, incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Now, in the sports card hobby, we've seen a like a real resurgence in the hobby over the last three years or so. Prices over the last couple of years had skyrocketed, cooled off some recently, but over the last few years as a whole, they've you know gone up incredibly. Have you seen, has Magic seen that same type of surge the last few years, or has the growth of Magic been more long-term and sustained? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's another great question. I think, I think, for me, uh, from the vintage space, I'm not talking about the modern collectibles. Um, I've seen a tremendous growth in the last few years, like you're saying, especially with the rise of cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the other, you know, I think the alternative coins too. Um, that space is all within that sector of collecting Magic the Gathering. Um, you know, most Magic players or collectors when they're young. They start, you know, they grow up into becoming tech uh, entrepreneurs, uh, lawyers, doctors, people that are in that space, right? So investing into Magic the Gathering into their childhood is definitely one of the things that I have seen. Um, and, and also, it's just, a, it's just an amazing game. I have to throw out there, like, I, you know, I, I'm 41 now, and I've been playing since I was 19, you know, or actually uh, when I was young in high school, so I was like 14, you know, so... It's, it's an incredible game, but some people get into it, you know, they quit, they sell their collection, sucks, then they buy into it again, and then what you see today is a resurgence of that. People are going on, on eBay and such, bidding on, you know, items they want to, you know, collect. They're fighting over collectibles that they want to have for their deck. It's a great, it's a great hobby. It's awesome. It's booming. Yeah, and so how do your customers find you? I know you do a lot on eBay as well. Yeah. So currently our website is vintagemagic.com. We're revamping it next year to do like more of a exciting a Wikipedia style. We want to be like a one-stop shop information. So if you're looking for uh, a Black Lotus, uh, the history of it, the artwork, the artist proofs, the, uh, the cards, graded or ungraded, uh, we're going to have more of a content related to that. So we're going to be focusing on developing the site more next year. Um, but yeah, our eBay store, uh, it's on eBay. Our eBay ID is Vintage Magic LLC. And we have active auctions and consignment items all the time. And uh, eBay has been a great partner of ours. So we really thank them for this. So for somebody who, uh, you know, sees opportunity in investing in Magic cards, maybe either they see it as an alternative asset investment or maybe they just want to reconnect with their youth and and collect some of these cards and kind of have them as part collection part investment what are some of the differences that people need to be aware of in how you would approach you know investing in magic cards versus how you would approach investing in sports cards yeah um i have lots of clients who kind of dual they multi uh, pokemon yugleo and you know they do different alternative assets i would say that in terms of differences, um, the biggest difference is magic is a game. That's very important. The cards are related and what I sell are part of this thing called the reserve list. Very unique where years ago, uh, Wizards of the Coast set an array, uh, a list of cards 
that basically stated that they will never reprint those cards ever again. It's almost like saying, hey, never going to report uh, re re reprint Michael Jordan ever again. Patrick Mahomes, LeBron James. Imagine that, right? So what happened is that these list of cards, including the Black Lotus, the Power Nine, stuff like that, it's basically around the 1993-94 era. These cards are heavily collected, heavily invested. So I, I, I would say that there's, you know, a lot of this feeling like, oh, you know, buy into the reserve list, right? Buy into these list of cards. That's what's going to make you a bunch of money. That's a, to me as a investor, you know, I always say, don't do that. I always say, make sure you understand that in our hobby, there are certain collectibles that have, are like the cream of the crop, right? The, you know, the important cards. Obviously, when you buy into graded cards from PSA, Beckett, and now CGC uh, out of Florida, you, you have a lot more value. So, you know, like I brought, you know, like you're mentioning, here's a, a Beckett uh, Underground C. It's a six, right? This, uh, this is an ungraded, you know, a graded card. You know, that's a reserve list card. It's a beta card, that version, second edition. And, you know, that card, you know, has, it holds strong value, has an like a, I call it more like a blue chip Dow Jones type of swing, right? Whereas you always have these other type of collectibles where you can buy into, uh, you know, this random car called Wall of Kelp. For those of you guys who know what it is, it's a terrible card. It's a reserveless card, but people think, oh, I'm going to buy a thousand Wall of Kelps and it's going to go, you know, like, like Bitcoin, right? Just, you know, you know, crazy prices. That's not how it works. There also needs to be a demand. So the demand of the game, right? The rarity the set, the, you know, maybe it's what it's won by, uh, you know, a, a famous, you know, player in a tournament. These factors are huge. And the thing I will also mention back to, I would say is the artists, the artists are the cool part of the game. Um, like this piece of art, for example, it's a print. This is the time walk. And this is a, just a print we have on, you know, our website and such, but we, we essentially, you know, the art of the game, these, these pieces are five by seven, original artworks back in the day. So back in the day, uh, the, they had very little money. They had 50, they, I think they paid the artist $50 and $50 a stock. And they basically commissioned the artist to create this awesome game. So people around the world who know this, that when you invest in magic, you invest in the art. You're buying with the artist prints, the artwork, the artist proofs, and also the altered cards. People go to these conventions like the National and they line up to get artists to sign their cards. And they're, they're basically like LeBron, they're like the superstars of our game, the artists. So yeah, so there, you know, there's there's a lot of risk, you know, there's there's up and down, um, but yeah. Um, unlike also sports cards, I will say, um, I think there's a lot more stability in it economically in the sense that it's not relying on the economy of America and, and also the world. Because when the COVID thing hit, or like, let's say that the, you know, there was a the 2008 crash, right? That type of thing. The magic cards actually held really well. And they do fluctuate 10%, 20% here and there. But all in all, um, because it's a game, people want to like still play their cards. People aren't selling their magic cards um, because, you know, it, it's kind of like, I almost call it like, kind of like drinking, you know, kind of like alcohol, beer, right? Beer, alcohol, all that kind of stuff all went up in value, you know, people kept drinking because what's going to happen during a crisis? You're going to still want to play your games. You're going to still want to love and collect the cards. It's just the way it is. It's weird. I know, but it's different than sports cards that way, I guess. Interesting. And yeah. what are you seeing in the other trading card game markets? I know you mainly concentrate on magic, but, you know, it seems as though Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, now you've got new ones like MetaZoo. Um, which have been real hot and garnering a lot of attention. Um, you know, what are you seeing in some of those other markets that's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, MetaZoo, obviously, Flesh and Blood, um, you, know, you, you know, those type of new games and, you know, it's awesome for the market. I have to say that um, as I, I kind of look at it like this, if those games rise in value and popularity, Magic will continue to rise even further. Uh, you know, I Wizards of the Coast was actually created with, uh, created, uh, by uh, also created Pokemon. They published, they printed it also in 1999. So collections that I buy Magic also, um, I also have a lot of Pokemon. I have a lot of vintage Pokemon too. I just don't really open it or collect it. 
But that growth in that has obviously exploded, as you know, with Logan Paul and all those YouTubers going after it. Stevie Aoki, I know he bought an Alpha Black Lotus, and also he does Pokemon stuff too. It, it's 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 huge, you know. Everybody wants to go back to their childhood in different areas. Um, I, I will say that you were saying about kind of type of investments. I my I am concerned about like a Meta Zoo and Flesh and Blood in the sense that people have gone all in on those type of things. For me, I'm more conservative on investing. I I, I like to diversify, but I like to make sure that I'm you know, exposed, but not overexposed. And there's a lot of people that are putting all their eggs in one basket. I highly don't recommend that. So that's, that's my feeling about it right now. Fair enough. Yeah. Everyone, everyone is looking for the next big thing. It seems whether it's now trading card games or sports cards or other forms of investing, NFTs, crypto, whatever it is, there's a rush to find that next big thing. And and uh, when people, you know, latch on to something that is trending in the right direction, you know, a lot of people are are buying into that and buying into the hype and, and hopefully it keeps going that direction. But as you said, you Absolutely. know, time will tell and we'll have to see. So speaking of the future, Daniel, let me get you out of here on this. Where do you think magic will be in 10 years? How might it look uh, a little different than it does today? How might all of this evolve? 10 years, right? Yeah. Sure. I get asked this, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I get asked this, you know, I have a YouTube channel also. I talk about magic investing. This is one of my, you know, favorite things is kind of like, future, future proof or future, you know, look, talk about it uh, for 10 years and down the future. I think older magic cards are going to continue to rise over time. Um, I don't think we are going to have the sudden boom, like sports cards did, you know, when Jordan rookies went from 30, I remember selling these cards for like 10 K PSA 10, 86 floor Jordans. And they just went to, you know, 750 K or whatever it did back and forth. We don't have that in Magic. I, I see them becoming like Dow Jones, blue chip stocks. Um, these ultra high end grade cards, I will say this, that like the as PSA, PSA is revamping their Magic sector. They're, they're going to want to get into it uh, deeper, you know, comparative to like Beckett, who is the leader right now. But those ultra high end Beckett or PSA cards are going to be huge. They're going to be even bigger. They're going to, they're the exponential values are going to be huge. The alpha first edition sets, just like you've seen with the first edition Pokemon, is going to continue to grow over time. It's just going to be huge. Uh, another sleeper I would say people don't really think about it are artist proofs. Artist proofs are limited generally to 50 in the world by for every card uh, created by the artist. So these are blank back cards where people are now getting them painted by, by the artists. Uh, and these cards are extremely rare. I think these are going to grow in, you know, in value. And obviously the artwork, the artwork, it's funny. I used to own the original Black Lotus, original painting, and I sold it for like low six figures. And now today it's worth, the guy prop, The guy wants like $6 million. That's all I got to say about that. So yeah, I mean, there's so much upside to it, but at the same time, I always say that, look, always make sure your, per, your financial, personal finances are perfect first, then invest in other collectibles, you know, you don't want to gamble, right? You want to make sure you take care of your family, your personal wealth, your health, and obviously then go into collectibles. Good advice for all. Daniel, yeah. this has been fun. Thank you for dropping lots of knowledge about magic and trading card games on us. We appreciate it. And thanks for joining the Virtual Sports Card Con. All right, guys. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. All right, everybody, I'm about to be Santa Claus because we're about to give away some incredible boxes like 2017 Prism Hobby and Absolute Football so you guys can find some kabooms in here. There's only four minutes left until the giveaway closes. This is your very last chance to register for the giveaway. If you haven't yet, you got four minutes till the giveaway closes and we start to randomize the winners. The link is on the top of the YouTube chat to enter the giveaway or you can go to sportscardinvestor.com Click on the virtual 2021 in the main menu bar, and then click the giveaway link from there. Four minutes, get your entries in. We are about to give away some incredible stuff. I knew it would be fun. I just didn't think it was gonna be this massive.
I'm Aaron Miller, and I'm a fantasy painter. I've done work for Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, Star Wars. The mood that I'm really trying to capture in my work, it's like looking at a landscape, but except I want to fill it with characters and creatures. So when eBay contacted me, I was, I was really excited about it, but I had no idea what to expect. Showing up at Gen Con and seeing this booth for the first time, is, it seems surreal. It doesn't seem like this can't be happening, but it is, and it's really exciting. There's still that part of me that's like, this is too much, it's too big, but I love it. I would totally do this again next year, given the opportunity. And at the same time, as a part of the community, I'm actually floored that another artist is, might have this opportunity after me. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see like who's next. All right, everybody, it is that time of the night to check in on the delivery of the big sports card boxes we are going to be breaking tonight. And in order to do that, we are going to bring in our favorite North Pole elf right now. Holly, how is it going up there? Hello, Jeff. I'm so excited to talk to y'all again. Holly, you look a little rough. It looks like it's freezing up there tonight. Well, Jeff, as a matter of fact, we here at the North Pole hit kind of a cold snap, but I'm sure it'll warm up soon. I, I certainly hope so for you. Should we be nervous at all about tonight's card box delivery? Oh no, nothing to worry about. Tonight, they're going to be receiving a 96, 97 Fleer, Fleer Sky Box Metal Basketball Series 2 and a 2021 Marvel Black Diamond Hoppy Box. Holly, those are some great boxes. That is awesome. You save some of the best for last and I get to open them tonight and give them away myself tonight. I'm super excited to do that. Thank you, Holly. By the way, how did that reindeer soccer game go? Oh, that was just practice. Tonight's the big match. We're up against the South Pole. Should be a real tussle of the tinsel, if you know what I mean. <laughs> does, it, does it really get rough? Oh yes, reindeers take their games very seriously. Okay, well, please keep us updated, Holly, on, on both the game and, and more importantly, on the awesome eBay box giveaway and the shipment status of those boxes. We need them here, we need them here so we can break them later this evening. And I cannot wait to see what happens in these breaks tonight. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, Jeff, it's gonna be a good one. I'll check in with you later with a full report. Just gonna go check on the heater. It's getting kind of cold, but I'll see. Okay, bye. Um, Santa. Last night on this show, we broke news that our brand new Hits app was in the Apple App Store. Tonight, we're breaking more news because just a minute ago, we released an update to the App Store that now gives you the ability to comment within the app, which is really cool. We're going to build an online community around the biggest hits from the biggest breakers. Hits is an app where you can get an endless stream of watching the greatest card pulls of all time. It's an incredible app built by our team here at Sports Card Investor, and it's free. It is free for you to download. If you have it already on your phone, you'll go back into the App Store, make sure you have the latest update, and start commenting. And if you don't have it on your phone, go to the App Store right now and search for Hits Card Breaker. Download the app. And I'm gonna make it worth your while. I'm gonna have a special prize at the end of the night tonight for somebody who comments in the Hits app over the course of the next hour. 
So make sure to comment in the Hits app and you will get a chance for a special giveaway prize tonight just for one person who leaves comments in the Hits app on different Breaker videos tonight. Make sure you have the update. Again, search for Hits Card Breaker in the App Store. Make sure you have the latest update so you can comment within the Hits app. All right, we are going to go to our first dealer of this evening. You saw him on our Card Breaker panel or rather on our dealer panel just a little while ago, and now he is going to be joining us to show off some incredible wax he has for sale. Let's go out to Las Vegas and let's bring in Jimmy from Awesome Sports. Let's see if we can connect with Jimmy here. And there he is, Jimmy, how are you doing tonight? How are you, Jeff? Oh, I cannot hear Jimmy. Can you hear Jimmy? Just one second, Jimmy. We gotta get you up here. All right, let's see if I can hear you now. Jimmy, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you great. You sound wonderful. It's great to see you again, Jimmy. Thanks for joining live. And you are one, you have one of the most impressive wax collections in the entire country. I've been a customer of yours in the past, uh, buying wax off you. I'm kicking myself that I didn't buy more wax off of you last year when the prices were a fraction of what they are today. You've got some incredible stuff in front of you there. Tell us, tell us, tell us what you got for us today. Well, um, today I got some the some product that um, I thought of just a mix with some of the older stuff and then uh, newer stuff. And I have some O3 for LeBron rookie year. This is um, Topps Chrome um, Kobe Bryant rookie year. Um, oh, that's a good uh, product. Top. That's a good. Pro you got some. You got some big boxes. So. First of all, Jimmy, before we start going through all of these individually, are these, how would people, how would people uh, buy these right now? Are these on your eBay store? Yes. So all, uh, most of these product is in our eBay store um, and then our uh, website at awesomesports.com. So um, they can pretty much uh, come to either uh, site and then uh, they can purchase it. Yes. Perfect. And is it all? Is it all buy it now? Do you take? Do you take any offers tonight? Uh, we do take offer, uh, but mostly we do uh, most of our uh, product is uh, buy now and then. But still, a lot of people just you know just send a private message and hey, can you take a lesser and uh, stuff, which is we we take a, a consideration as well. Okay, and I know sometimes you'll do maybe a bulk discount. I know, I know you and I have worked on that type of thing before. Yes. I bought a lot of stuff off of your eBay store. Uh, you guys do a great job, an incredible wax collection. And, and before we start getting into this, Jimmy, I know you and I share something in common in that we are both big believers in investing in sealed wax. I, I've done episodes on the show in the past about why ultimately I think sealed wax is a better investment than individual cards, even though cards are more fun to collect for sure, wax is often a better investment. Curious to curious to get your perspective as as somebody who's you know done a ton, uh, had a lot of success in the wax market. That's correct. Um, so my belief is um, it's like unopened wax is a it's like a you you actually when you buy certainly of unopened wax you cover her entire rookie class where when you actually take a gamble on the certain individual player, um, they sometimes it, it, it rises, sometimes it falls. Like for example, uh, 2000, let's say 18 football, where at the beginning, a lot of people talked about like a Baker Mayfield, there was a strong uh, rookie quarterback class. And then first year, the who came a rise, which is Lamar Jackson. So if you bought a lot of this earlier uh, draft rookie class, there's a lot of quarterback was a bust where um, the Lamar Jackson, a lot of people didn't really go high on that 2018. However, if you would have bought an open product, which it covered the entire rookie class, where you, that 2018 uh, unopened wax never dropped the value because uh, Lamar Jackson carried it. And the following year, uh, Josh Allen carried it. And then um, it's, uh, historically, for example, we if we give a 2003 for basketball, LeBron rookie year, where uh, back in 2003, you could um, you could have bought like a, let's say exquisite, for example, you could have bought um, on open. So at the time, I had a, let's say two hundred twenty thousand dollars. I could have bought 
uh, LeBron RPA rookie card for about around $20,000, where uh, exquisite unopened case was around the $4,000 case at that time. So essentially, you had the choice to buy LeBron James uh, RPA rookie card or five case of exquisite unopened cases, where I, t I bought unopened cases. So where that year, easily Dwayne Wade, Carmelo Anthony, Chris Bosh, some of these players could rise and Lamar, uh, LeBron James uh, might not have made it. Uh, but let's say if he made it, even today's world, where it really doesn't pan out buying investing in single cards because LeBron, let's say, 9.5 or PSA 10 rookie cards probably uh, go about three million or so in the um, that that's the kind of price range it's been selling for. Where unopened exquisite cases are uh, uh, selling for about a million um, each, which is that's a five million dollar. So even you look at some of the history, unopened products are clearly it's a better investment and then it's a safer investment because yeah. everybody loves to open boxes, right? So as a year goes by there's going to be lesser, lesser unopened product and then more and more single. That's just kind of how it happens. I, I'm with you 100%. And that's good. You threw out some great numbers there. I appreciate that, Jimmy. Well, for people who might be interested in getting into it, take us, uh, tell us the various boxes you have uh, for sale right now. Yes, yeah, so we have, um, I had listed a lot of this uh, national treasure and a lot of prism uh, product because it, those are the, uh, some of the product that uh, really popular right now. Um, and then, uh, for example, let me give you this uh, product. This is a kind of a interesting product. It's a 1212 Prism Hobby Basketball box, and there's a seal case, which is a, you just don't see it. We should put it in the museum. So this uh, product is a basically first year Panini uh, Prism uh, Basketball product, and then where it was a double rookie year where there was a uh, Curry Irving and then Anthony Davis was a, um, the, you know, the number one overall draft pick. And then obviously superstar like LeBron James and Kobe Bryant, they're even like a base card is worth a lot of money being first year. That where um, I wanna just, um, just throw some, like a fun fact is that back in 2012 and 13, a lot of people really didn't know who Panini was. Everyone was just so used to like upper deck and stuff like that. So back in days, can you believe these are, where today's a Prism become a household name, Prism product back in the days, where they just, uh, manufacturer just uh, couldn't sell out. So they had to do the closeout. <laughs> so <laughs> some of these uh, hobby box, back then, like, you know, Giannis year 2013 and DZ cards, these box were closing out at thirty dollar a box, and wow. then right now this box is probably about runs about about fifteen thousand dollar a box. Can you imagine thirty dollars a box? Wow, <laughs> they were having to put prism, prism on box. sale. That's right. That's incredible. That's an incredible story. Um, so and then um, I would like to just say some of the baseball product or soccer where. I personally really, really like uh, a lot of uh, tops of Sapphire product. Um, just, just the looks of it. Everything looked like you know cracked ice on the uh, Panini product, and then they're just uh, online only. So it's a kind of well distributed uh, among uh, just consumers. So I like that their concept and then um, just the looks of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm big fan of uh, Sapphire, and then we constantly try to not to run out of a. Uh, sapphire, there's the F1 Sapphire, there's the um, Soccer Sapphire, there's the Baseball Sapphire. So Sapphire seems to be very popular. And I'll, I just, uh, uh, we constantly uh, sell on the eBay store and then it's been one of the hottest to sell uh, for, uh, so I just uh, like to uh, display that as well. And then uh, this is a, um, a product that I, I think uh, we got really lucky on. It's a 2017 uh, Prism uh, football, so which uh, is that <laughs> that that's a Mahomes year, as you know. Um, and then we have with the National Treasure and Prism, and then this is a first of the line Prism right here, where um, you know first half of the season, um, some of this uh, Mahomes uh, product was very slow, but once again he you know he started to prove us wrong where he they're just having incredible second half, and then um, his uh, product start to rise, and then so I just like to. Um, you know, display um, this uh, 2017 uh, Prism 
uh, and then a national treasure uh, product as well. Can you, can you imagine being Jimmy right now, ladies and gentlemen, and being surrounded by all of these just all-time <laughs> iconic boxes? I mean, this is an assortment of all-time iconic boxes you're seeing and not not having the temptation to open them. Could you do that? Let me know in the chat. If you were in Jimmy's chair right now, could you just re relax and sit back, or would you have to grab one of these and start ripping it? <laughs> I, I tell you, you know, every day I, I, we talk to our employees where one day, you know, my one of my bucket list is that I want to just just one day decide to I'm just going to open about million dollar worth just on open wax and just kind of how it feel like like that's kind of one of my bucket list to believe or not. I love it. I hope you get that opportunity, Jimmy. That's that's going to be awesome. Uh, let me let me know when you do, because I'd love to come there with uh, with our cameras and film the whole thing. Because you want to talk about good content, I guarantee that video will get a lot of views. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely let you know. Fantastic. This is great, Jimmy. So let's remind everybody how they can find your stuff. I know it's awesome sports, and just to make sure everyone understands the spelling, it is uh, it's actually in the lower left corner of the screen. It's A U S U M. That's how you're spelling awesome. And they can find you on eBay, and they can find you on your awesomesports.com website. Yes, that's correct. And um, um, I also, I, if you don't mind, I would like to um, talk about real quick about the trade show we were putting out uh, in Las Vegas. Um, Absolutely, we did. We obviously caught that a little bit at the at the uh, the panel that we did earlier. But but yeah, just remind everybody again if there's anyone out there who wants to find out more information about this. I'm gonna be there. This is gonna be a fabulous show. I'm going to this show. I'm super excited about what Jimmy's done. So yeah, let people know how they can uh, find out more about that. Yes, so it is gceshow.com. And then we are actually, uh, I, I just wanna bring just a national size uh, trade show in the West Coast. Um, so we are actually hosting one in Las Vegas in right before March Madness, so March 2022. Uh, it's going to be on the 300,000 square foot space with the, uh, we also reserved um, new, uh, the, the, the football stadium, uh, Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. Uh, we're going to have an after party on the football field. And so, you know, we can just kick some field goals and stuff like that. Um, and then the, our trader show is um, basically, we, we try to bring different concept and traditional uh, that it's it's going on and then hopefully a lot of people are having fun with it and then um, starting next week we actually going to have a huge um, that all the people that who uh, participate our uh, trade show we're going to do probably about a surprise uh, uh, like a hundred thousand plus uh, on open or this a product uh, giveaway uh, starting starting next week so it's just a kind of uh, look for that event as well and then wow. yeah awesome gceshow.com right yes all right guys go there now gceshow.com and make your plans to go to vegas in march the weekend prior to march madness it is going to be an amazing time i will see you there if you make it in vegas and J jimmy i will see you there i'm looking forward to it my friend oh absolutely absolutely look forward to it thanks for joining the virtual thank you thanks for having me Absolutely. Take care. All right. And we're going from one great dealer and Jimmy to another fantastic dealer. We're going to go down to, I believe, Tampa and bring in Miss Sports Cards. We're going to see if we can get her. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm being told by my producer. It's time for some giveaways, ladies and gentlemen. I forgot. How could I forget? How could I forget that we need to do some giveaways? My goodness. You all out there in the audience are so patient. You're wanting, I gotta put on my Santa hat for, for the giveaways here. Let's see, I gotta get, my team has randomized your entries. Let's, uh, I gotta call it up here. Wow. I look emo. My team's telling me this is emo? This is emo? All right, hold on here. We'll put this off to the side. Let's see if I have my, uh, I do not yet have my giveaway winners uh, loaded in my phone. So we're gonna need to go. <laughs> We're going to need to go tell our data department that we need giveaway winners. Bring us giveaway winners, data team. The audience is waiting. They are eagerly, eagerly anticipating 
giveaway winners. Show them what you're giving them away. Show them what, okay, show them what I'm giving them away. This is known, ladies and gentlemen, this is in TV, in TV world, this is, this is called the stall, the draw it out, the buy some time right now while we try to get things uh, going behind the scenes. That's what we're doing. So we are, this is a box of Prism Hobby 2017. That's going to be amazing. We've got Contenders Optic 2021 Basketball. That is a big hit product. That's going to be amazing. You get the rookie ticket autos. Uh, from our friends at Tops, we have the Chrome Legacy 2021 Tops. That's going to be amazing. We've got 2021 Absolute Football. We're going after, uh, we're going after Kabooms in here. That's going to be amazing. Um, these are all courtesy of Tops and Panini and especially eBay because eBay has given us the majority of all of our giveaways. They've been awesome. We've got Topps Archives Baseball 2021. We have Topps Chrome UEFA Champions League. What year is this? 20, is this the, is this, what am I looking at here? 2019. Is that Mbappe? Is 2019 Mbappe? Call, talk to our resident soccer expert. I think this is the Mbappe year. Is this the Mbappe year, 2019 UEFA? We've got uh, Star Wars Masterwork. That's a cool box. We've got Garbage Pail Kids. We got all kinds of stuff. And we're, we're getting our giveaway winners up right now. Do we have giveaway winners? I don't know what that is. Okay. What is it? No, it's not, it's not Mbappe. All right. It's not Mbappe. I, I, I swung and missed. Okay. Boom. I thought Mbappe was in that soccer set. Okay. Here we do. Here we, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in Anna while we're waiting for our giveaway winners, ladies and gentlemen. We, uh, it's taking extra time to process the giveaways tonight because there are so many of you that are going to win all of these amazing prizes. Those, by the way, what I was showing you was just the boxes you're going to win now, but we also have other boxes tonight for our box breaks too. So lots of opportunities to win this evening. But let's bring on Anna, Miss Sports Cards. Let's see if we can connect with her and bring her in. And there she is. Anna, how are you doing this evening? Hi. I'm good. How are you? I am doing great. I, I appreciate your U.S. men's national team kit there. That looks great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I like your get up too. Thank you. Yes. I, I appear a little bit out of sorts at the moment here, but it's, it's uh, yes, it is. We're in the holiday spirit. We're giving boxes away. Now, are you down in Tampa right now? Correct. Okay. So and it's down in Tampa. And you're getting, I know you've got a shop in Tampa. Tell everybody about that. So uh, it's actually, so I help out at the shop. Uh oh. Do we lose Anna? But lose uh, it's definitely uh, fairly new still. Um, but obviously, uh, Matt, Brian, and myself, I mean, we've been very active at the shows. I think a lot of people know it, like from the shows that we were there and stuff. But it's nice having, you know, the guys that really uh, go going brick and mortar. It's like a completely different direction, um, and they've adjusted really well. So I think it's doing very, very well. Awesome, awesome. And we missed, we missed, we, it cut off for a second. So we missed where the shop was. If people want to go check it out. Um, so it's uh, actually right, right in Tampa, uh, Loops area. Um, but it's actually very, very pretty close to where like the convention center and stuff. So, uh, it's, it's a pretty good area. Um, and give us the name. Again. Yeah, you, Tampa card shop. Okay. Very easy. And you're going to be at collectors con this weekend, right? For sure. I'm very excited about that. That is a big card show in Tampa. Um, and Anna, you can find her at collectors con this weekend in Tampa. I will be there tomorrow. Actually excited to, after this wraps tonight, I'm getting Perfect. on a plane tomorrow morning, heading down your way. Um, excited I was, for that show. I was, figuring, I, was, I was figuring that you would, uh, be there. So I'm going to be looking I, forward to it. I know you like it too, though. So as a city, we've talked about it before. So absolutely. Absolutely. Let me see. Oh, you know what? Anna, I'm going to give away a couple of giveaways here. And then we're going to have you show, we're going to have you start showing off some cards as well. Um, but let me announce a couple of these giveaway boxes because the audience has been very patiently waiting. So we're going to start with, oh, we're going to start with one of the really big ones, guys. Let's give away this 2017 Panini Prism Basketball Hobby Box courtesy of eBay. And that is going to J, rather, I'm sorry, GL Hop, GL Hop, H-O-P-P-E. That is yours. Congratulations. The 2021 Topps Archives Baseball 
Hobby Box is going to row, row and our, or it's Rowan Ryder, sorry, Rowan Ryder 92311. The 2019 Topps Chrome UEFA Champions League Soccer Hobby Box is going to J Capo 4. The 1986 Topps Original Series 3 Garbage Pail Kids Chrome Hobby Box is going to Likes to Bluff. Likes to Bluff. All right, we're going to give away the rest when we wrap up with Anna here in just a minute. Um, but those are the first winners. If you win anything tonight, fill out the prize winner form on sportscardinvestor.com on the virtual 2021 page. All right, Anna, you always have such an incredible selection of cards, a lot of soccer cards, I know. What, yep, what do you bring to show us this evening? So I actually uh, have a little, let me see if I can turn this. Um, maybe I cannot. All right, well, I guess I'll have to just show you uh, myself here. I actually had them laid out here uh, in front of me, but uh, I don't know if you can see. So obviously with World Cup going on, uh, some oh, Pulisic yeah. autos. I know you're a fan. Yeah, you're teasing you like me with these. You're teasing me with these. <laughs> um, with the, uh, the Eminent USA uh, and the uh, Obsidian as well. Sorry, there's kind of a glare there. Um, but uh, obviously anything in USA, I'm kind of a fan of. Um, so I always have some of those. Um, I've always been uh, big with the, well, World Cup relevant, but I think I've had these all through the year, no matter when. Um, just the, the numbered parallels of the, the Ronaldos. All right, if you can see that. Uh, 2014 Prism as well. Um, and I think they're going to obviously grow a lot more popular uh, in the short time coming. Yeah, that's the 2014 Prism World Cup set. Is that right? So 2014 and 2018. So both. Yeah. So yeah, I like the, both of them. Iconic, uh, in iconic the sets. color match red, which are always numbered as well. So. And as you're showing these more cards, rare. If, um, uh, as, pe if, as you're showing these. Let's see. Let's people, test out your soccer want... skills. Who, do you recognize <laughs> this, Jeff? Uh, yeah, of course I do. Mr. Holland there. Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Holland rookies, obviously. Um, uh, I've all, you know, I always have these, I always pick these up, but I think it's about being a little bit more picky now. Uh, so I go for the, the lower pop ones. I think the Sapphire ones are very popular. Everyone always wants the Sapphire, but I actually, uh, far more, I like the speckle, um, way, way lower pop. It's like not even comparable. So I always like having the stuff that's a little bit more rare if possible. And I know you are the same. I, I appreciate the soccer trivia, but but Anna, yeah. I, my knowledge has grown a little bit. Not now, not a whole lot, but but just enough. I, I I know. I of course I have to know who Holland is. He's he's. But uh, but I have to say, like from when I first met you, where I think you know soccer, not oh, at all. Oh, I do nothing. I do. Nothing. I think you were curious, but I remember you saying your team was like all into it. Um, yes. I think you've come a long way from that. I have then, come a so. long way. I appreciate it. Thanks in part to you. Yep, guys. you have. <laughs> now, now, before we show more cards, real quick, if people want to buy these or make offers on these, are these all on your eBay store right now? So, um, some of them are, but I've okay. also brought some that aren't, so which are more of like the, the collection uh, pieces. But yeah, uh, eBay store, obviously, if they're in Tampa this weekend, because I think a lot of people are coming in from out of town. Um, you'll be seeing these cards uh, in person as well. And so if, if for, for ones that they may not find in your eBay store, I guess on Instagram, I know you've got a big Instagram a following under Miss for sure. and Sports if Cards. If it's something, if it's something that maybe I'm not selling mine, I've also gotten to know a lot of people that also, you know, if they were looking for one, I could definitely point them in the right direction. Um, just because, you know, I think the, the, the soccer network is pretty tight. So, uh, we help each other out. So if there's anything that you do see um, that you know you're looking for, definitely let me know. Uh, should be messed on Instagram, and I will uh, help them acquire it. You I, too, Jeff. Don't worry. I, oh well, th well, thank you. Everybody, go give you know, a <laughs> follow right now. She's a great follow on Instagram, Miss M I S S underscore Sports Cards. We'll bring that back up on Perfect. the screen again as well. Go give her a follow. Awesome. Well, let's let's see some more beautiful cards.
Yeah, we're almost done, um, but I couldn't leave out here. You should know this one too, right? Jeff? I do, of course. Mbappe, you got his, uh, you got his true rookie there, and then you got his tops Chrome rookie. It looks to me like. Correct. Look at you. So uh, there's a lot of debate of which rookie's the rookie, um, and I've had all of them. <laughs> so, but I think that these two, to me are the main ones, um, as much as I love the 2018 World Cup Prism set, right? I think a lot of people like that one. I have to say these two are the ones for me um, that I would consider the, the rookies to keep. So look at you. You've been doing some. Well, All right. and, and the reason why is because I believe in the investment potential of soccer cards. And we've talked about this before. While the soccer card market has escalated very quickly, quickly over the last year, I still believe it's got a lot of potential ahead of it. You know, with the World Cup coming uh, towards the end of next year, and then of course the World Cup coming to the United States in 2026, I, I think the game is only going to continue to rise in popularity in America. And I think that's going to, and, and the pop counts of soccer cards are still really, really low, especially if you go back prior to this year. The product in previous years was really short printed compared to any of the other major sports. And I think that's what I appreciate the most because, um, I mean, Jeff, I've seen you at shows. Um, I don't do just soccer cards, um, but it's just it's cool being able to see like a lot of these soccer, cards, even the ones I've shown, um, you know, the pops are like under 30, you know, and in basketball and football, I mean, you know, we don't, we just don't see numbers like that. So, but definitely solid point. And that's actually why I enjoy soccer a lot because just the rarity factor, the fact that there's only 15 of them and having one, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and like you said, previous years. So another set that I really, really love, um, are these, uh, it's the 2017 select, um, yeah. the Mbappe yeah. ones were super, super popular. Um, but I'm also a fan of the Ronaldo, and the Messies as well. Um, pop counts are, you know, in a PSA 9, it's pop 15. Yep. You know what I mean? Uh, and a pop 9 in the checkerboard Ronaldo. So uh, super, super low. And then right now, a big PC of mine, um, if you've seen my Instagram at all, uh, Alex Morgan has been a big one. And uh, so I picked up this one. So it's the select, it's the blue um, oh, cool. out of 299. And I was super excited about that. Uh, but then somewhat recently, I was actually able to pick up this probably my favorite card at the moment for how long we'll see um, is this one. I wish I could get it. Right? Tie dye number to 25. It's the, yeah, correct. It's nice. yeah, it's the tie dye one um, BGS. Um, but one of the cool factors also is that, so the tie is numbered, uh, it was numbered out of 30 and this one's actually 13. So it's Jersey numbered as well. Ooh. So I think, uh, this one is going to be one of those cards that I, I may never put onto the market, but, um, definitely, you know, it's one of a kind in my eyes. So I think this one's staying with me. It is. It is indeed. That's the select tie dyes that look awesome. Definitely, definitely one of a kind. Anna, you are one of a kind as well. A great dealer. Everybody, go give her a follow. Miss underscore sports cards on Instagram. And Anna, I look forward to seeing you this weekend. Oh, I think you cut out for a second, Jeff. Oh. Well, I was <laughs> just saying. I was just saying. I look forward to seeing you this weekend at the Tampa Card Show. For sure. Awesome. Sounds good. I look forward to seeing our safe travels, and I'll see you in Tampa. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining. Talk soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's do a few more giveaways here. We got so many boxes to give away. We're going to pick our next set of winners. Let me call them up here. Let's see, where do we leave off? The uh, We're going to do the 2021 Topps Chrome Star Wars Chrome Legacy Hobby Box. That is an awesome product. Oh, my goodness. Topps knocked it out of the park with Star Wars this year. That one is going to Richard Deep, D-I-E-P, 650. Congratulations. We've also got the 2020 Topps Star Wars Masterworks Hobby Box. This bad boy. This is going to Baj, B-A-J, 1998. We've got the 2021 Panini Absolute Football Hobby Box. Kaboom! Let's get some out of here. 
That's going to Nice Kicks 405. You win the entire box. And then also courtesy of Panini, the 2020 Panini Contenders Optic Basketball Hobby Box is going to Kyle Wills. Kyle Wills, congratulations to you. Let's throw in a year of market movers as well. Who wants to who wants to win a year of market movers? That's a market movers pro. That's a pretty cool prize. We're giving a free year of market movers pro to Chad. Simply Chad. He's baller enough that his email is just Chad. These, by the way, all of these things are the first part of your email address. If that is you, go to uh, sportscardinvestor.com, click on the virtual 2021 in the main menu bar, and then go fill out the prize winner form. If I have not called your name yet, do not despair because we are gonna be doing a incredible break at the end of the show tonight, including 1996 Fleer Metal Basketball Series 2 with Kobe and Allen Iverson rookies you will have a shot to win your way into the break. I'm also giving away a bonus prize tonight to somebody who is commenting within the Hits app. As I mentioned earlier, we've just released an update to the Hits app just minutes ago that allow you to comment on the various videos in the Hits app. Go make sure you get the update. Go to the App Store to get the update for the Hits app. Comment on a video. I'm going to pull a random person who's commenting on a video during this show, and I'm going to give you an extra bonus prize that you're going to like at the end of the evening tonight. Uh, and so all kinds of stuff happening. Um, and by the way, if you don't have the Hits app yet, search for Hits Card Breaker in the App Store to download the Hits app. So much going on. And uh, let's see. All right. Oh, you know what? It's serious time, ladies and gentlemen, because we are about to get to a very serious. I got to take this off is we're going to get to a very serious part of the show. We have three guests who I'm going to be bringing on back to back to back. The first is Nat Turner. And I will tell you, I talked to Nat earlier. The Nat interview that you're going to see is actually from earlier. During the interview, Nat announces that the, that the uh, regular service level at PSA a $100 service level is now open. However, however, there's a, there's a but. It is not yet actually open on PSA's website. It is, however, open through Sports Card Investors Grading Bulk Submission Service. So we can get you the $100 rate. You cannot yet get it directly on PSA's website. You will be able to get it on PSA's website in the very near future future. It's a big announcement. Nat was trying to break news today. We recorded the segment earlier. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves, but it's big news nonetheless that PSA is going to be going down to $100. And if you want that $100 service level right now, you can get it by going to sportscardinvestor.com and click grading in the main menu bar. Soon, you'll be able to get it through PSA Direct. Uh, but uh, we're going to bring, so we'll have Nat. You guys will get to hear that interview. And then we're going to roll into DJ Ski and Josh Luber, ladies and gentlemen, Josh Luber, the head of Fanatics' new trading card venture, he has told me he's going to drop some bombs, some bombs. We're going to have an incredible conversation, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to miss it. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's get this going. We cannot have a conversation about the future of the sports card hobby without bringing in one of the most important people in the sports card hobby today, and that is Nat Turner, the head of PSA, the head of collectors, and there he is. Nat, welcome to the virtual holiday. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and I know the audience right off the bat is going to be curious to hear about what's happening at PSA. You guys are reopening a grading level. That's a big step forward. Tell us about that. And then also what people might look forward to in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first we were, we've been making a ton of progress on our backlog. Uh, that's been the thing holding us back from reopening. Um, we've been very focused on making sure when we reopen our turnaround times are 
I would say satisfactory. Uh, right now, you know, for the lower end service levels, it's uh, you know much uh, you know much more delayed than we'd like. Um, but we uh, did just reopen our regular service level, which is just one level below Express. Uh, Express has been open for a few months. Um, we are doing it in a kind of a metered way, so we're only allowing a certain number of cards uh, per day at that level to be submitted. Uh, actually. Uh, from both dealers and what we call retail, so just collectors submitting themselves. Uh, that's a big deal for us. Uh, we basically are, are committing a certain relatively small percentage of our daily capacity to the new available service levels, such as regular, um, we're, which we're comfortable basically dedicating the rest of the of the capacity towards the backlog as we still work that down. But we want to be fully reopened, you know, early next year. It won't, it won't be January, I wish, but. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, kind of late Q1, early Q2, we want to we want to start opening up, uh, you know, the the lower service levels, even below regular. Okay, so you think there will become a point next year? It sounds like maybe even first half of the year, where you guys are kind of back to having all of your service levels open. Yeah, we we that's the goal. Uh, like I said, we're probably going to end up metering, um, for lack of a better word, you know, to control the um the demand uh we according to our customers you know if we were to reopen today at you know the pricing we were at earlier this year we'd probably be right back in the same situation we're we're in currently you know with a big backlog and slow turnaround time so instead of just keeping the price you know i would say out of reach for most people we're going to have pricing that is obtainable more accessible but just control the number of uh of submissions that can actually be uh sent in uh, we think that's a pretty good compromise for folks um, who want to send in cards but are just waiting. Yeah, it will definitely be exciting for the sports card hobby to have those levels open again. And I totally understand the need to meter it because I'm sure there are many people who have shoe boxes full of cards that are ready, you know, marked as to be sent to PSA the day you reopen some of the lower service levels. Uh, but it's great to hear that you've made that progress. You know, that's that's really exciting. The grading landscape has changed a lot over the last year. There, there, there now seems like there's, I don't know, 15 different grading companies with three level, three letter acronyms of all different types. I don't know why every grading company has to have a three letter acronym, but they almost all do. Um, and and some have brought you know kind of dis different interesting uh, twists into grading. How has that changed from PSA's perspective? Do you guys pay attention to what these other companies are doing? Are you guys just concentrated on continuing to be kind of the high-end leader in this space? Or, or how do you position yourselves? Yeah, I mean, we certainly, uh, I mean, as a collector, you know, I see all of this stuff on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I think people get, take a lot of, uh, get a lot of pleasure from tagging me and things to kind of try to get me riled up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't usually work because, you know, frankly, we're just heads down focused on getting through our backlog, but all the while we're building a ton of cool stuff, technology, new offices, uh, you know, hiring people from folks to receive packages all the way to graders and machine learning uh, engineers to build, you know, the latest and greatest software that we need, uh, and our collectors want. So it's been, uh, very much a heads down, uh, year 2021. I don't see, uh, you know, that changing next year. Um, so we don't really pay that much attention to them, but, you know, it's great to see, frankly, companies in general and venture funding come into, uh, cards. I, I never thought I'd see the day, you know, being in cards as long as I have been. And it's, I, you know, competitor or not, it's it's actually, I think, good for the hobby to see all this new stuff happening. So, A rising tide rises all boats. I completely agree with you. It's, it's wonderful to see all of the interest, all of the companies, all of the startups. Uh, it's just a good thing for the market overall. You mentioned machine learning and software, and a lot was made of PSA's acquisition of Genement. Uh, when that happened several months ago. And now actually Kevin, who is the founder of Genemin, is actually running PSA on a day-to-day -day basis. Are we starting to see some of that type of technology in the grading process or will we next year? Yeah, it's not yet. Uh, anyone who thinks, you know, 
their cards got graded incorrectly or too strictly was because of Genement is inaccurate. That's inaccurate. Um, we're not using any machine learning software um, in the, uh, excuse me, let me turn my phone off here. Uh, we're not using any technology in the grading room just yet. Um, we're very focused on building uh, more scalable software that it takes time to kind of train the grading room to use. Um, so we're focused on, on getting rid of uh, some of the manual processes around counterfeit detection um, first. And so Genement's going to be used for basically comparing uh, incoming cards, raw cards to known counterfeits, uh, which you can actually tell at the pixel level uh, pretty easily, believe it or not. Uh, and that just allows the graders, it's like a, a diagnostic check before the graders even have to waste their time on a counterfeit card if the system can flag it. So that's going to be the, one of the first things we launch. Um, it actually won't be in the grading room technically. It'll be uh, once the card shows up in our office, it'll actually run once it's imaged. Uh, that's probably one of the first. We're also, we're actually using this now, but not in grading. We're using what we call uh, automated spec ID. So when a card comes in and you know the customer writes what they think the card is, we have to confirm that. And oftentimes it's wrong uh, and, and we need to get it right. And there are parallels and variations and all sorts of things. So the system can actually, uh, and this is live technology, not the whole team yet, but soon, where a, um, a spec ID, the, the card's unique ID is assigned to it using a computer. Um, you know, it's a really cool piece of tech and, and that'll reduce over time. Unfortunately, every company, including us, mislabels cards from time to time, you know, on the label. This is an example of software, you know, hopefully eliminating that um, over time. And so we are actually using that. That actually came out of that acquisition uh, in part. Um, so it's it's starting. Next year is when we're launching a lot of cool things in the grading room. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, I'm glad you guys are being so technologically proactive on all of those fronts. And, you know, this year has been a big year of change overall for the sports card hobby. In fact, I can't imagine a year where more change has taken place. And you've got obviously the news of Panini and Tops losing their licenses in the future for the sports leagues and Fanatics coming in and taking over some of those licenses in the future. Um, I'm curious to hear from your perspective as a collector, as a longtime collector, what do you hope to see out of Panini and Tops? during this period where, while, while they still have the licenses? And then what do you hope to see from Fanatics down the road in the future? Yeah, I mean, from, from Panini and Tops, it's pretty simple. Uh, well, it's something I don't wanna see, and I'm, I'm probably one of the last people they'd listen to, but um, would be um, don't overprint. You know, I think, mm -hmm. I think you know, both companies probably have an incentive to do that, uh, you know, because they have a limited license and they wanna, you know, profit as much as they can from it. I don't think they do that. Honestly, it's, it's, it wouldn't be the right thing for the hobby. And I know a lot of people who work at both companies and, you know, they, they all care about the health of the hobby. And that's one of the quickest ways you can bring us right back to the late eighties, uh, early nineties, you know, as if they were to do that. So that'd be number one. You know, I, I personally think things like sticker autos, redemptions, um, you know, jersey patches that can't be guaranteed to be associated with the player or even game worn or so on. Like all that stuff I think should change, but in reality, you know, it's probably pretty hard to change those things, certainly in a limited license situation. Um, so switching gears to Fanatics, you know, I think they have a huge opportunity to, you know, I would argue those are more features like to fix those or bugs, you know, to fix those bugs. Um, you know, those aren't wide, large scale things. I think large scale, my, the thing I'm most excited about is fanatics can grow the hobby. You know, they have a lot broader reach. I mean, very few people know about tops, I, I would say, or Panini compared to the fanatics name and the, the leagues and teams they're associated with. So that's the biggest opportunity. I think the challenge is, you know, fanatics has never manufactured a trading card before, as far as I know. So, you know, they need to learn how to do that or acquire uh, existing companies or both. And, you know, hire people who know how to manufacture good quality cards that collectors want to collect. And that's not easy. Uh, you know, as much as we all like to bash the card companies as collectors, you know, it's a, it, they have a hard job. Just like, you know, I like to say we have a hard job. If you say everybody has a tough job in this hobby, it's not, nothing's easy. And so Fanatics has to get serious about card manufacturing. Um, but if they do, you know, they, I think they can truly grow the hobby. 
Yeah, one of the things I really love about Fanatics coming in is just the amount of money they're going to be investing in and the amount of publicity they're going to be bringing. I'm really hoping that when we're sitting back on our couches watching NBC Sunday Night Football five or six years from now, that the starting lineups are actually introduced by showing the sports cards of the different players. If you start to see that type of integration with the sports leagues and with you know, the fanatics manufacturing the cards. And of course, with the sports leagues now owning part of this new trading card venture, I think they'll have the motivation to be integrating to that degree. And if you start to see that, I think it's going to be a wonderful thing overall for the exposure for the hobby. I agree. I can't wait. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure you can. I'm sure mm -hmm. you're, I'm sure your graders are excited about the, you know, millions of additional cards that might be coming their way from all of the new people who might enter the hobby if that type of thing starts to happen. Well, more importantly, as a collector, um, I uh, personally am very excited to have new, kind of a new, uh, kind of fresh take on design and, you know, kind of product creation. I, I like the current companies, I collect both, but I just, I love, you know, I think change is good, you know, for a lot of reasons, so. Yeah, change can be good for sure. It's gonna be fun to see how it goes. And speaking of you as a collector, um, I know you've got, we don't see it in the background right now, but I know you've got a nice little wall display up there I've seen before. You got some interesting yeah. stuff with you. Show me, show me a couple of things. Yeah, this is a, a pack, uh, a shadow box I had built for um, packs, graded packs. So I, as you saw, a couple were missing. So I took, I took one down. So this is the 1997 Metal Series 1. Uh, there's, there wasn't a series two, technically it was just the championship, but that's my favorite pack just because, um, that's the, um, PMGs, the, uh, red and green PMGs, you know, are live in this product. Have you ever pulled a PMG before? Yeah, I pulled, well, it's been a long time, but, uh, in 90, probably 97, I pulled, uh, Carrie Kittle's green. Um, I was at a card shop in Texas and I remember it was upside down. Uh, the card, the base cards were faced up and then I was like halfway in the pack. It was face down. I thought that was weird. And I flipped it over and it was, <laughs> it was, it was green. I didn't know what that meant, but to be honest at the time, I was probably 11 or 12 and parallels weren't really a thing. We had refractors, but really unique, like different, almost frankly, different design parallels weren't a, a big thing at the time. So it took me a little while to understand it's, and it was out of a hundred, the serial number, which we weren't really used to either as collectors. You may remember, like that was like really only the second year that it, that had been a thing. So I thought there was a hundred, I was like, ah, but then the, the card shop owners guy, Igor told me, um, well, actually it's the only 10 of them are green and so on. So, but I haven't pulled one since I'd be, I'd like to. Yeah. That well, and and maybe maybe there's one in that pack. You'd have to bust it out of the slab to find out, which I suspect you're not going to do. No, no <laughs> but I, I know didn't. you did open uh, this product recently as well. Yeah, I didn't get a PMG. That would have been nice. I have I have a number of boxes unopened. I'm really hesitant to open them. The odds are really low that there's a PMG red or green in them. Um, so. I don't know. I don't think I did get, I got all the good base cards, MJ, Duncan, Kobe, et cetera. I got, I beat the odds. I got two platinum portraits, which are, I want to say out of 288 packs. And I got two, they were actually in the same pack, probably a difficulty with collation or, or something, but um, yeah, it was, a, and I, I think I got an autographic, so I'm trying to remember, but um, yeah, it was a good box for beating the odds, but you don't really make your money back unless you hit, you know, PMG. So. Sure, absolutely. But hey, they're fun to rip. It's the chase is always fun, yeah. right? And here's and a so cool pack. This is um, Magic. The, this is an Italian version of Magic: The Gathering from 1995, which is pretty cool. Oh, very so, neat. Yeah. Well, so I know PSA grades packs, and I know PSA has been expanding grading into different areas. Obviously, you guys uh, made a move in the video game grading space with an acquisition. Um, and I think you're starting to grade Funko Pops now. Is that right as well? Well, if they're autographed. Um, so we, we do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen some of those at card shows recently. What about grading sealed boxes? So like, you know, in, instead of just packs, has there been any thought about grading, grading that, you know, uh, unopened metal box? Yeah, we'd love to. We, we have some ideas. Um, 
you know, for us at collectors, it all comes down to experts. So, you know, we, I think we have the world's greatest experts in cards and coins and video games and autographs, but we don't really have the expertise in unopened boxes at the moment. Um, I mean, I fancy myself an expert on those, but to be honest, it's, it's actually really complicated in many ways, more complicated than cards. Um, cause you have shrink wrap and you have individual packs and you have very different nuances across the years. Um, there's a lot of tampering, you know, involved with these sorts of products. People weigh them, they reseal them, they, you know, do, they swap out packs. They do all sorts of, of, there could be completely inauthentic. You, you may have seen there was a big bust of, of fake Pokemon product recently. So we, you know, before we, uh, get too deep into it, we want to, we want to approach it the right way. So no plans as of now, but something we'd love to do personally, I'd love to see us do that, but. No plans right now. Yeah, it'd be it'd be great. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this, Nat. This was great to have you on. I'm excited about the new PSA service level that just reopened, as well as hearing that more are going to be reopening early next year. Hopefully, fingers crossed on that. Thanks for sharing that news with our audience, and uh, happy holidays. You too. Yeah. See you soon. And we are now joined by a very special guest, world famous DJ and, and uh, music industry insider, businessman, entrepreneur, and sports card creator, philanthropist too, all of these things, DJ Ski, Ski. What's well, up, Jeff? Hello. It's great. Hello. Hello, indeed. There we go. It's great to have you on. You've been doing a ton of stuff in the sports card hobby. In fact, most people watching are probably have probably seen the many different cards you've been designing. You've been part of, of Topps Project 70. Um, you designed these incredible promotional cards uh, at the National and uh, just so many different things. I, I get, give everybody a little bit of a rundown of what this year has been like for DJ Ski in the sports card world. Man, this year has been absolutely insane on on all fronts, right? And and sports cards are a key and central part of that. Um, the thing that I didn't really expect this year was to j jump in on the and 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 have my cards react like this. Um, we started doing some stuff with Tops last year, and when Project Seventy came about, they asked if I wanted to be involved, and it was kind of natural for me because. As a DJ, I was always, especially coming from the mixtape era, I was always responsible for creating my covers, right? Like, and that was how you sold CDs and, and tapes and things back in the day and even got downloads. It was based on the art. That's how you drew people in. So I had always done those things. I operated and built my own website. So I knew a little enough to, to be dangerous. And I was like, I came up with this concept. When they first asked, I had to think of something. I was like, what can I really do that would make sense? Because I didn't think it would be just me like drawing on cards. I really wanted to storytell. And I leaned in on the music component just because, you know, my, my whole life is like music, sports, and to, to remix those together and basically create this whole series that we've dubbed the remix this year has been insane where I've mixed, you know, sports and music elements to, together, launching with Tops and Project 70, evolving to eBay to the drops that we did at the National, at Gen Con, at Comic-Con, um, even the redemption packs that we have there, and, and even launching my own like backpacks with Minnesota Twins and uh, Capsule Collection for the 30th anniversary of our 91 World Series win. So, you know, it's just been a whirlwind and a, and a true dream come true and to interact with so many great people and hopefully introduce this this market and the whole sports card world to to a new audience and bring in new people. There's no better feeling than seeing that. So this year has been a true whirlwind and, and incredible. And I've had so much fun and I'm so honored that, that, you know, you guys in the market have reacted so favorably to to my releases and drops. And I can't wait to, to continue growing and doing it even bigger next year. Yeah, it's been awesome seeing uh, all these special drops of, of the cards you've designed on eBay. Uh, garnering real good prices, a lot of a lot of market activity around your cards, and you know, deservedly so. You have taken a very you know artistic approach to what you're doing, combining it with music, as you said. So, kind of bringing those cultural elements into sports cards. You're really taking the sports card community and combining it with art and combining it with culture and putting that all together. Is that where you see the future of this going? 
Hundred percent for me specifically, right? Like that's what makes sense. If you look at my my career, obviously in my name, I'm, I'm a DJ. Music in the music industry is the reason that I'm on this stage and have this platform. And I've always been such a big sports fan. And that started with the TV show. I used to, you know, bring on artists and athletes together from, you know, notably like Kevin Durant and Kendrick Lamar, putting them in the studio, bringing them to games, creating content, um, running to the, some of the game day entertainment that you see doing me doing with teams like. The Minnesota Vikings, like what we've done with New Orleans Saints, recently the, the Michigan Wolverines, um, who are who are on, on a pretty good run right now. Um, and, you know, to, to be able to remix all of these elements together has been, is, is just the perfect intersection for everything that I do. I always play kind of in that middle of like music, sports, culture, art, lifestyle. And, and that's the lane that I think that, you know, for, for me, I really want to, to own. And like, as a DJ, I'm a remixer, right? And that's why we remixed these cards and, and, and tied all these, you know, incredible albums from Prince and Kirby Puckett with Purple Rain together, uh, Ronald Acuna and, and AT Aliens, you know, Kanye West and the Chicago drop that we did with eBay. It's just been phenomenal to look at the reaction to see. Like we launched a campaign with eBay called the 10, 10, 10 program, where we took 10 of each of my project 70 cards. Um, we got them graded by PSA. We found the ones that would grade 10 and then I, I signed them and they're so stringed up with the, the signing process. It was crazy. So we had to make sure that they would sign as 10 and individually numbered them out of 10. And I think the Otani one was the highest selling one. And, you know, those numbered out of 10 were selling on eBay for, you know, upwards of almost $8,000, which is just incredible to see that the market reaction for that. And I'm so grateful for, for all of you guys. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, how many cards did you, how, what was your, what was your plan there? Like how, how many cards did you have to submit to PSA? Cause you can't, obviously they're going to grade them legitimately. They're just not going to, you know, oh. give every, every card you give them a 10. I as I'm actually t blown away by the level of detail that PSA does. From I mean, I did walk through the whole grading facilities and was just blown by how many layers and how many checkpoints were there. I always thought it was just like some guy in a room like grading stuff, right? Like probably like many of us do. Like it is a legit operation. And you know what we do because we did this program in partnership with them is I send them a hundred cards, all the cards that I order from Project Seventy, and they get to go through them until they find ten cards that will grade a, a, a 10 and it's not easy. Not a lot of them do. So we have to go through, sometimes we've had to go through more of that and try to pull others to find like another one or two. And even there, like I have to sign them in person. They'll tell me like if the signature doesn't like, you know, isn't like if there's a little thing off in the pin, they won't grade it a 10. Like it's, it's a stringent process. So they find those 10 out of the hundred that we send them. And then I go down there and sign them all. So um, they've been a great partner to work with on this as eBay has is promoting it out. So, you know, it's been a really, really fun campaign and congrats to all the people that, that have got them. They look really, really good in those slabs. And we've done some really cool pin colors on them too. Yeah, that's really cool. Those are those are awesome cards, and we haven't seen them. You've had some recently that have been going on eBay. I know you've got like a big sneaker auction thing you've been doing right now, and that includes if someone buys a, a sneaker in your sneaker auction, which, by the way, a great charitable component there, and that includes a card as well, right? Exactly. So, you know, I've, I've, I'm cutting down on some of my sneakers, and we're donating a pro portion of the proceeds to City of Hope, which is a charity that I work with and it's close to me. Um, and so for each purchase... Um, I think there's like 808 sneakers that I have out of like 2000 that, that are in the collection. They're all individually numbered and serialized. And it has, you know, a really, it's actually probably the, the, the most realistic card I've ever made. It's, you know, it's based on the Drake album cover of the meme of him, uh, of the, you know, the baby moms. Um, for me, it's me holding a bunch of various pairs of sneakers. So it's, it's probably, you know, it's like a self portrait, which is the truest thing. It's like me, cards, sneakers, collectibles all in one place. Now, I, I get mad at my wife because in her closet, I think she's got about 50 pairs of shoes, which I think is just outrageously excessive. Did I just hear you say you have a 2,000 sneaker collection? That's why I got to cut down, Jeff. It's too many. You know, I realized like it's just too much stuff. I don't, you know, and, and that's why I was like, let's give opportunities. So many people have always wanted to, to come to me and I've never really sold anything. Um, and people have always wanted to get something and, you know, I wanted to really get things back so we could give back, have a charity component, um, let people like create their own memories and stories. I've had such a great career and I've been so fortunate in my life to see so many great things and have so many great memories. I want to see what the next generation can do and create those memories and see what those, those sneakers can have. So yeah, I still have way too many, but it, it makes life a lot easier cutting in half. <laughs> I suppose so. Well, enjoy the 1200 pairs you still have left or so, right? Um, <laughs> We got, we got this card in, uh, 
literally just came in the mail and this is incredible. This is uh, when you were at the national, you and eBay ran a promotion together that I thought was very, very sophisticated, which was that people at the national could go buy eBay's booth and every day they were at the national, they could get a, a new DJ ski card. This was a giveaway. So if you went by eBay's booth, you got a DJ ski card as a giveaway. But for those who were able to go by eBay's booth all four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you could then show those cards and then you get a special fifth card mailed to you that is numbered. And mine just showed up here in the studio. So these are just being mailed out now. You got and it before is, me, Jim. I, I still haven't got my physical copy yet. I wanted to make sure it went out to the fans and to everybody that did that first. So I, I literally don't even have a copy of it yet. That's funny. So this is the Chicago Championship uh, Redemption, only numbered to 808. So there are 808 of these. So you must have had, I guess, 808 people at the National who collected all four and then were able to get this fifth one. I was shocked. I didn't know what to accept, expect. I didn't know if it would be, we didn't know if it would be 50, 100 people redeeming them. The fact that we got 800 people redeeming those was just absolutely insane. And for, for Chicago, I mean, and like, I know eBay sponsoring this, so we're not doing this as like part of a sponsored bit. This is reality. Like eBay is so great to work with. They really gave me the creative control to do what I wanted. And I said, let's do something for the national. It's the first time we're back together post COVID. Um, I really wanted to make a splash and introduce my cards to a new world. Since we were in Chicago, Chicago is such a great sports legacy. I was like, let's take the four major men's sports, four iconic moments from them, and pair them with four iconic music albums from Chicago, all themed with, with Kanye West covers. Because Kanye not only is you know probably the biggest artist ever from Chicago, but he has incredible art that Virgil actually helped design several of these covers, RIP to Virgil. And... I wanted to do something, you know, these cards that we do, and you see the quality of them. They're, you know, 130 points thick stock. Like the foil is ridiculous on them. Even, I mean, just the plastic cases alone nowadays too for those thick ones are no joke to, to secure with the supply shortages. I mean, we sell and, and these cards are expensive to produce. And, you know, I sell the companions on my site for, you know, just under $100. But I know that's unobtainable. And as a kid, I remember not being able to afford a lot of these cards. So I wanted to do something where we could give back and that would encourage trading and encourage like this gamification of cards and get just create something fun that anybody could have. So we created these, you know, four cards that anybody could get for free just by stopping at the eBay booth. And then secondarily, like if you got all four, if you figured out how to do it, if you were a hustler, if you wanted to put in the work, right? It was something that at the time you couldn't buy on eBay. You could track it down and trade or negotiate with others on site, but you had to redeem them by that Sunday. You couldn't do it later on. It was something that, you know, um, I, I knew would create a lot of energy. And that's why we saw so many lines and craziness and so much fun. And, and it was just so great seeing people really embrace these cards and, and collectors coming up to me saying, hey, I'm, I'm not familiar with you, but my nephew said, I have to go get this card. It's the only thing I have to do there, as well as getting approached by people saying, hey, this is the first card I've ever gotten. I love this, just the music parallels there. And this is drawing me into sports cards. So being able to do that, you know, it worked, you know, that was, you know, it worked even better than, than I imagined. A big shout to eBay for letting us have the creative control to, to really do something that wasn't done and, and, and letting me underwrite those costs to, to do something fun that really gave gave back to the, to the card community. For me, it wasn't make, like made no money off of that. It was literally just something I wanted to do to give back and get in people's hands. It's kind of a thank you for, you know, my, you know, having so much uh, love and getting so much, you know, great reaction from my card releases this year. And it's something that I think you'll see us continuing on and through uh, 2022. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, that was, it was a great promotion for sure. And speaking of your love for cards, you are now the part owner of a card shop. Uh, one of the one of the ones in the nation that one of the best ones in the nation has gotten a lot of attention. Cards and coffee um, out in LA opened up during the pandemic. Tell everybody a little bit about that. Absolutely. So it was funny because I have a, a I had a retail space that was open at my my studios in Hollywood. We have an incredible space right in Hollywood and Vine, central area, central area um, of you know the most famous street in the world. And got connected with um, Dan, who was looking for actually he was going to open a shop at the W Hollywood down the street. And I said, hey, I was thinking of doing like a sports card sports kind of gallery at my space. Would you be interested in doing that there? And we connected, and it just made made sense. And we both were good friends with Aoki. Brought him in, and you know. Um, you know, we were like, hey, let's let's see what happens. It felt like it was something that was needed. And again, the goal is really to introduce a new generation and a new audience who might not be going um, to or might not be familiar with the card space and create something that was more 
bespoke and boutique, almost like the sneaker boutiques came out when there was already like foot lockers and things. And that really helped take off with the sneaker scene. We wanted to do the same and create just a really cool energetic space that, that anybody could walk into on, on Hollywood Boulevard. So it was great. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait to get out there and see it. It, it, it looks, it looks amazing. And, oh, and yeah. uh, your growth has been great there. So congratulations. Yeah, it's been really fun. So what's next? How do you top all of this? You had such a great year. And, and by the way, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about your Minnesota Vikings because I, I, I don't think after this last weekend, we should really have any conversation about them, but let's talk about Michigan, the Wolverines who you, uh, you were there uh, when they, when they took down the juggernaut of Ohio state, you were actually DJing for the stadium. You were doing a big ski promotion there. Um, you were like, you were front and center. Uh, what was that like? Man, that was, a, that was incredible. I mean, it was funny. I, I grew up in Minnesota, but um, I was always actually a Michigan fan growing up. They had a great football team. Minnesota wasn't ranked at the time. And, you know, I loved Charles Woodson. He was one of my favorite players. And I used to play them from NCAA. And, you know, I've always been a Michigan fan since like the Fab Five and stuff. Um, got connected with Harbaugh's team uh, a couple years ago before the pandemic. And they talked about what we could do. They'd seen what we've done from the entertainment side with some of the other pro sports teams and leagues from Minnesota, where we've won Best Game Day Entertainment, the NFL for a few years, um, working with Coach Payton and the Saints, working with the NBA and doing things like entertainment for the NBA finals and things. And they were like, we want to do something in the big house. And we talked about doing something. Early, obviously, last year was COVID. Earlier this year, we talked about something. We couldn't make the dates work. And then it came down about you know a couple of weeks ago. They're like, this is the game. It's shaping out. We need to make the stadium louder and give it more energy than it's ever had. So we put together a little program, uh, brought in the entertainment. I brought my DJ booth. We built a whole like LED wall, put together a whole like plan to, to amp up and energize the entire stadium. And, you know, for, for me, it was one of the coolest shows I've ever done in my career. I mean, definitely the biggest. There's no stadium bigger in this hemisphere. So to play for 111,000 people was just absolutely insane and then to get them all singing and rocking and jumping up and down and the fact that i mean like look ohio state was an eight point favorite going into that game the fact that we were able to to beat them and pull it off and just the energy and you know connecting with all the players the team the, the organization the boosters everybody in michigan it was a dream come true it felt like home and really excited to do do more stuff with them so uh go blue it's going to be a fun fun run for the for the college football playoffs all right, we need to we need to get you down to uh, some of my Florida Gator games next year because I think Let's go. we we're going to be I think we're going to be an underdog a fair amount next year, Ski. So we could use that underdog energy that you were able to bring to Michigan. Oh yeah, we hyped it up and it was crazy. Everybody like it was funny like the players, the coaching staff, even Harbaugh's wife who came up to me were like, "This is the loudest the stadium's ever been," which was just like such a validation, such a crazy feeling, especially as a DJ that grew up and watched it and loved sports and being able to do that in the biggest stage, at, you know, one of the biggest games that, that, that the big house has ever held. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, we get, we're, we're going to get you out of here, but final question, what is next for ski in 2022? Oh, you're going to see more cards, of course. I've got, I've got to figure out ways to, to level up and, and, and ups what we even did this year, right? Like for me, it's always about growth and how we create really cool things. I definitely think you'll see us collaborating at some of the cool card shows and figuring out what we can do to top the national next. So um, check us out and always check those eBay booths out at, at, at those shows. And yeah, you know, djski.com, we're going to be releasing a bunch of more cards. We're always trying to do fun, cool stuff. There'll be a lot more products too. I started getting into doing different drops like with Herschel um, on the bag side and with MLB. So there'll be some more fun things this year. I mean, at the end of the day, I just like to create, to have fun and create products that, that I want for myself. It's really, you know, a passion project for me. And I'm so thankful that you guys have, have always shown so much support and, you know, everybody out there watching for all the love this year. And you'll, you'll definitely see us doing more stuff with, with Tops and a lot of the major brands as, as well. And we've got to find something to do something, uh, you know, for one of the sports card investor events, I think, Jeff. Hey, that sounds great to me. Maybe next year is virtual. We can have our own, our, our own special DJ ski drop. We'll see. We'll see. Let's what go. Controls. Let's go. Let's go indeed. Awesome ski. Great to talk to you, man. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thanks for joining the virtual a holiday sports card show you're the man jeff thank you so much happy holidays everybody take care all right everybody i am joined now by an extremely important guest let's welcome josh luber 
the founder of StockX, but also now the chief vision officer for Fanatics Venture into the trading card world. Josh, welcome to the virtual holiday. Thanks for having me, man. I, I am absolutely mortified that my background and my decorations are nowhere near yours. It is, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, when, I'm now, you, you had, when I've talked to you in the past on this show, you've had an incredible mm-hmm. sneaker room, but you moved, right? You, you had to move away from that unbelievable sneaker room you had. It takes a process to, to get it back, right? So we're getting there. I got shelves. Nothing on the shelves yet, but we're, we're getting there. So eventually. One, one step at a time. Yep. One step at a time. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, I, is the new room, though, is it going to be just sneakers or are you going to work cards into that as well? Yeah, when I built that the sneaker room last time was 2015, and I hadn't gotten back into cards at the time. So no, the new room will look way different. Think of it more like uh, part Foot Locker, part Bank Vault. Cool, awesome, awesome. Well, we we are excited to see it. Well, we'll when we have you back on next, you'll have to give us a little more right. of it. Absolutely. But, but in the meantime, I know every one of the audience is, is incredibly excited to hear about all of Fanatic's detailed plans. And I know you're about to lay them out, Josh. You're going to uh-huh. give us every plan Fanatics has for the next 10 years. Tell us all of the secrets. I actually brought the board deck. I figured, why not? Let's just share the entire board deck. The enti- no, look, it's, it, it's an extraordinary position to be in and uh, unbelievably you know, thankful that um, that I could do this. This is why I left StockX um, to work with Michael Rubin and Fanatics and, and try to put this together. Um, obviously, it's a process. We don't, you know, as everybody knows, um, you know, the new entity, the new entity, which is majority owned by Fanatics, but also partly owned by some of the leagues and players associations, um, but is a separate company. It is not, uh, it is not Fanatics, it is a separate company. Um, uh, as as most people know, you know we've acquired licenses for baseball, basketball, and football, but we don't yet run those businesses. And until we do run those businesses, um, which could happen in, in a number of different ways, in a number of different time frames, it could happen very quickly, it could take uh, quite some time. Um, until we do, there's really not that much to talk about. There's really not that much to, um, uh, to uh, look, at the highest level, I I do want to say, though, that when we do take control of those and we do start operating them, um, this will be evolution, not revolution. We have some ideas, some big, some small, about how we will operate them and and the ways that we will change the industry. But we're also cognizant of the fact that um, industry is doing pretty good for the past couple of years, and we don't want to mess that up. And there's a lot of people that that love it, and, and the core of the industry is more important than the growth and the new people, but I think the new people and the growth is an extraordinary opportunity. And so that'll be the balance for us as we get into operating the business is how do we grow the whole industry? How do we bring all these people in, but, um, but understand what's important and, and the core and, and the, the people that, that have got us here. So. And that's, and I'm, I'm fascinated to ask you about some of this. And, and I know, you know, we're going to talk about some of your philosophies here, not necessarily fanatic specific plans, because I know, as you've said, that's a lot of that is still pending on when right. all this is going to start and everything like that. But, but you, you put a lot of your thoughts and philosophies out to the world fairly recently with your, your report that you released, Trading Cards Are Cool Again. You published that to the web. Um, when I first, you know, you, you, you had texted me the link when you put it out and I, I clicked on the link and at first I was expecting, you know, to see like a, a one one paragraph or one page essay and instead it was a 50 plus pages of a extremely detailed deep dive into the history of the sports card market but also more importantly the factors that you think influence prices and and demand and all of that i thought it was fascinating and of course it gives us it gives us an insight into how you're thinking and how you're how you may be thinking in your terms of approach in the future so i want to talk through a few of those concepts one concept that you repeated consistently throughout the article was supply and demand and you made the point early that um the times when the hobby has gone into crisis before is when supply far exceeded demand and demand for the most part has exceeded supply the last few years, although, although there's maybe some signs that in certain parts of the hobby, you know, maybe supply is getting a little too big with printing and 
base card runs or the number of, of kind of parallels and refractors. Talk to me a little bit about your, your, your thoughts on supply and demand and how you would like to see that be better managed in the future. Yeah, it's, it's core to everything. Uh, I mean, the supply and demand and, and managing that and the balance is, is the whole thing. And, um, you know, as, as I was writing that piece and it's worth noting that, um, those are my thoughts. Anything in there is, is, is me. It's not, uh, a, a fanatics level state, uh, statement. It's not a, a fanatics trading cards, um, uh, publication, but, um, but everyone was very aware that I was doing that. And so, um, for whatever that's worth. But the supply and demand concept is uh, what will determine how well this industry grows. Um, as we were researching for the uh, for the paper and writing it, you actually had a, a, a podcast about uh, 2020 select and the, the changes in 2020 select versus 19 and 18 and, and previous years with regard to number of parallels and um, specifically. And it goes to show that you can have a lot of very rare cards and cards that are individually numbered low, but the overall supply is very high and, and th that doesn't mean anything, right? If you have always sort of tongue in cheek, if you have a million one of ones, then you have no one of ones, right? Everything, if everything is unique, then nothing is unique. And, um, it is for us to grow the business and as I said before, like that is the goal is, is to, to grow the entire industry, to grow everything. Um, we have to figure out how to, how to sell more cards, how to put more cards in the hands of people that want them without devaluing those cards. The long-term value of the cards is the most important driving factor as we create cards. doesn't mean that every card is going to be valuable. doesn't mean that every card is going to increase in value over time, but more often than not, you can't have people buying boxes, buying cards and it being worth less than they paid consistently, not ongoing over time. Now we all know that opening up box of cards, you're usually expected to lose on that. Your, your ROI is usually going to be negative because we're trying to chase those hits. We're trying to chase those parallels, but if the parallels themselves are not also, also valuable and hold their value, then you start to, to get into a very, very dangerous territory. It's not, a, there's not an easy solution to this, by the way, and, and sneaker industry is running into this trading card industry has been dealing with this for years. And it's just more of a, an idea that you have to keep that philosophy in mind as you're growing. But what's really interesting about the trading card industry generally is across the three major sports, you have about 40 to 50 sets per year. It gives a lot of different levers to create a lot of different supply levels, a lot of different quality levels, a lot of different channels that you can distribute it. So there's a lot of stuff to play with to try to get that right and make sure that on, on par overall, that the value does maintain in a long term, And that's, that's the important thing. Yeah. And I, I love that philo philosophically. I mean, one thing that I wish that the current card manufacturers would do a little bit of a, a better job at is be more transparent about which sets are their higher end chase sets and which sets are, are more for the everyday hobbyist and, and just be transparent about it. And then within those higher end chase sets, make sure to preserve the value. I felt like with select, for example, and I, I said that in that podcast you're referring to, I felt like Panini took select in previous years from being a very exclusive high end hobby shop only set that was very desirable to an investor like me. And they took it down to the level of being a just, you know, mass printed, available everywhere, uh, you know, crazy number of variations available. And, 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 and I hated to see it. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, do you think, do you think in the future, that type of segmentation, is that the way that we can keep the price of some products low enough to make it attainable for kids and make it attainable for people who want to buy a cheap box just to rip? but at the same time, preserve the value of cards for those who look at it as an investment. Right, right. I mean, you're exactly right in terms of what happened to select. Highest level, it went from, from a hobby product to a retail product, right? And, and that, that has a massive impact on, on everything related to it, including, right, perhaps the value of, of your previous select cards that you've bought, which is, which is a shot in the arm to a lot of people that have invested money in that. Um, Transparency is everything. And I have this idea, I don't know if it's possible, but I have this idea that um, we, should, we should 
be transparent into production numbers across the board. We should tell everybody how many of every product that is created. I don't know if that's possible for a lot of different reasons. Sneaker companies do it on some very select shoes, but generally they don't. Trading cards do it for some very select sets and generally they don't. I think that I think the market is smart enough to handle that information. Maybe the initial shock of it, you know, it, it, it has some implications, but I think over time the market is smart enough to handle that that information and then it's all there out in the open for people to understand that hey, this is high end product, it's premium, there's more chase elements, it's it's less less supply. This is is more populous and it it should be on the shelves at Target. And if you do that, if you know the delta between how much hob, how much is printed for of a hobby product versus a retail product, people aren't going to clear off the shelves of that of that retail product at Target. They're going to let it sit there and let the kid go buy it because they recognize that the the value is way more. I should spend my time trying to buy the hobby product or or, or something different, right? Like the idea is if you have a holistic strategy, supply and demand across all the products, there should be high end stuff that sells for big dollars, but there should also be product that is always available. For anybody who wants to go buy a pack of cards for a dollar, for that that proverbial kid to go in and walk into to Target or Walmart or or his local convenience store and buy a pack of cards. And by the way, we want cards everywhere. I want to have cards. You know, people are concerned that that hobby shops won't get cards. I want I want first of all want ten times as many hobby shops, and I want to have trading cards in you know in in convenience stores and and baseball games and like there should be trading cards everywhere. But back to the point, people should know what it is they're looking after. And if it encourages those resellers and, and the, the investors to stay away from the stuff that has massive volume, great, let the kid go buy that pack. That, that is, Josh, the, the greatest thing I've heard you say. I, I, if, you, if you are able to do that with Fanatics, and I know this isn't any type of official plan yeah. you're giving us today, but if you're able to bring transparency to print runs, uh, and have you know the product segmented so that they are available for the kids who want to get in for a dollar a pack, but there's also the higher end products with very transparent print runs. You will have you will have collectors and investors universally worshiping you and fanatics for doing that because that is one of the biggest complaints I hear every single day, and it is a complaint that I feel about the lack of transparency right. around how much of this stuff is actually being printed. And, you know, and even on a set level, you know, how do we know what this, this set is worth this you know, versus this thing? Do we understand the print run dynamics? It's all very cloak and, and dagger right now. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you are, are, you know, thinking in terms of transparency. And I know, you know, one of the things you did uh, at StockX, which I thought was awesome. I thought it was the best thing StockX did when it came to trading cards was the IPO that you guys did with that Bowman Chrome X product. You guys ran a a Dutch auction, but you did it for a new for a release of a new set, but you did it in a very fair, consumer friendly way. And then, you know, Panini started after you did that. Panini started running Dutch auctions for the drop of new products on their site, but they did it differently. Yeah. They did it in a way that whatever price you bid was the price you paid. And unfortunately, that screwed a large percentage of the people who were buying products because you're overpaying because you, you don't know when to jump in because it's not transparent. Right. In your case, you, you allow people to place a bid at whatever they were comfortable paying, but whatever it actually ended up going for everyone paid that lowest price that it went for. So it, it, it had this amazing effect of everybody feeling like they got a good deal. That's right. I, I look, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. It's, it's one of my most favorite things and in passion. Uh, this is, this is the continuing vision from day one at StockX through me leaving and, and why I'm um, in this industry. I think that the, um, using true market pricing, which can only be accomplished a couple ways. And, and my belief is the best way to do that is by using what's called a blind Dutch auction. What Panini uses is called a declining Dutch auction. Obviously these are, you know, confusing terms that most people don't encounter on a, on a daily basis, but in a blind Dutch auction, everybody pays the same price. And by the way, over 95% of the people end up paying a price less than what they bid. So even though that price ends up usually being much more than what the retail price would have been, because these are usually products that have high demand. So people want to buy this product. 
um, everybody wins. Everybody wins. They get it for, for less than what they bid or, or exactly what they bid, but they all pay the same price and you're buying the same asset at the exact same time. It's completely illogical for people to pay a different price for the same widget at the same moment. Panini's, you know, declining Dutch auction. It's fun. You know, there, there's an engagement level, I guess, but except for that last person, everybody kind of loses, right? Everybody got it. Everybody paid more than, than somebody else. Um, you know, Panini makes more money that way, frankly. Um, and, um, you know, I don't like, you know, I'm just very against it. I, I think it's a really poor way to, to, to sell cards. Um, and so that idea, the, the, what we did that the Bowman Chrome X, uh, release with stock X and tops back then, that was a, a huge impetus for my, this entire move for me to move into the trading card industry and do this. And it, we will absolutely use that method to sell some cards. I, there's no way that you sell all cards that way. There's no way that you sell all products that way. But again, to my earlier point, if you have a holistic distribution strategy across all different products, all different channels, then you can have very high demand premium products that are sold as a blind Dutch auction and are released at a fair market price. And it's fair for everybody. And then you have other products that are retail and they sit on the shelf and they're always a buck or they're always, you know, $10 or, or whatever it is. So it's an important part of the overall philosophy is to leverage blind Dutch auctions, which we call our IPO or initial product offering um, to use those very strategically, probably across every single sport. Yeah, that's, that's awesome to hear. As I said, I loved when you did it with StockX. I, I love that you're kind of beating the drum of transparency and fairness and fair market pricing. That is going to be so good. And one of the things I've said, Josh, on this show repeatedly, you know, people have asked and I've commented about like my feelings about Fanatics and the Fanatics deal. And I said, look, I said, if you look at the big picture here, we are, we have a company in Fanatics that is placing a massive, massive bet on this on the future of the sports card hobby people who are are far smarter than me who you know deal with billions of dollars you know on a daily basis are betting that in the future sports cards are going to be worth the the industry as a whole is going to be worth a huge multiple of where it is today and if you just simply look at the numbers of what fanatics put in um, and then, you know, the fact that people are investing at certain dollar levels in this venture, and then of course, what those people might expect from a return on investment down the road, and you start to do that math out, you start to realize that the thought process of a lot of these investors is that this thing is going to grow light years beyond where it is today in terms right. of participation. And I think that those types of of uh, you know the transparency, the fair market approach, et cetera, are going to be the things that really help sustain this in the long run. But it's got to be difficult because I know you know with it, from the standpoint of the manufacturers, and I'm sure you're going to feel some of this pressure at Fanatics. You could make a quick buck today. You could pad your profit and loss statement this year by simply printing a little more product or using techniques like the declining Dutch auction to sell it, which isn't fair to everybody. Isn't that always just going to be a crazy push and pull about like, how do you, how are you, yeah. how are you preserving the long term and not just generating profit today? Yeah. Look, I'm enormously thankful to Michael Rubin and Fanatics and, uh, you know, our, our investors who have, um, you know, believed in me and my vision for how I want to um, how I want to run this and, and what I think is, is important for the growth of the hobby. Um, and, but I'm also, you know, very aware that, um, they put a lot of money into this and, and a lot of their reputation and time as well. And it's important that the company is, is, um, financially successful and, and stable. Like those are, those are two, um, uh, not necessarily divergent, but sometimes, uh, create friction. Um, you know, fanatics trading cards, the entity that, that we run. Um, it's a private company. There is no plans for it to be a public company. And, um, and hopefully that will enable us to have the flexibility that we need to make the changes, um, in the short term and, um, and not have to be, um, wed to short term, uh, goals. Um, we'll see how that, that plays out. Um, but that's just the, that's the nature of, of business. It's a, it's the nature of, of running a company. Um, you know, that said, um, I wouldn't have done this if I didn't think that I had the buy-in of the people that matter to do this the right way. Um, and, um, and 
for everything that I've seen so far, you know, supports that. Like I said, you know, they've been phenomenal and, and I'm very grateful for them to, to at least so far to, to give us the, the freedom to set this up and run this the way we think is best. That is awesome. That is awesome to hear. And having the sports leagues involved is another thing that I've been so excited about. Do you think they're going to be active participants in this? Do you think we could actually see like the NFL and the, and I, I know you don't know for sure things have to play yeah. out, but like, do you think the integration between the leagues and cards and the teams and the athletes and cards, do you, do you expect that generally to get closer over time? Yeah. I mean, frankly, it's kind of crazy that the leagues and, and PAs, the players associations, um, and, and for, for anyone who doesn't know to create trading cards, you essentially need two licenses. You need the leagues, which gives you the right to do the league marks and you need the players association, which gives you the right type of players. As we know, Panini, for example, has a, a, a deal with the Major League Baseball Players Association, but not Major League Baseball. That's why you see Panini baseball cards that have no logos on them, right? It says Mike Trout, Los Angeles Baseball Club on them. Um, it's their business. It's their business. We're just stewards of it for them. We're just the, the ones who, who operate it. It is their business. Um, there would be no business if it wasn't for, for Major League Baseball and Mike Trout. Um, and so um, they should be owners in the business. Um, yes, it gives them, you know, added incentive to, to work more closely with us, but they have to work closely with, with Tops and Panini today anyway, when, uh, when you have all the th thousands, tens of thousands of autographs that are done every year, um, the players associations help facilitate that when, um, you know, same thing with regard to, uh, to memorabilia and, um, you know, memorabilia cards and, and things that have in there. So either way, there's a very close relationship. And it just makes sense that they should have a piece of the business. Um, for us, you know, having them as uh, as partners is is great for for a lot of reasons. Um, but I don't think the customer will see too much difference um, because of that. Um, you know, by the way, the, the autograph issue between sticker autos and uh, and just the, the the breadth of autos is another very challenging issue, right? Because everybody wants to have to to get autograph hits. Um, and everybody wants to have autographs on a lot of sets, but nobody likes sticker autos. And, um, so there's, there's, there's challenges across the board. So the closer we can work with them behind the scenes, make that more efficient, make that more cost efficient. Um, that just should be better for, for everybody from, from the consumer standpoint. But again, I don't think you're going to see a very big difference in the consumer experience because there are partners, but it's the right thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, you just heard it here. Josh Luber just announced that sticker autos are permanently forever going away out of the sports card hobby. We will never have them again. Yeah. Uh huh. Or, or, uh, we will put sticker autos in every pack, um, standalone and you can do whatever you want with that. You can oh, stick you your, your Zion auto onto an Alex Caruso card. I, I tweeted that. And I think some people thought I was serious. So. There you go. There you go. Look at that innovation mm -hmm. already happening with Josh mm -hmm. Luber in charge of the venture. Okay. I know we, we got to go here in a second. My producer is giving me a, a, a wrap this up signal, but this this has been so fascinating. I got to mm -hmm. ask you one or two more questions sure. before before we wrap. Um, I'm curious uh, the the sneaker market, which you had so much experience in. You had this this quote um, in your trading cards are cool again article about how everybody in the sneaker market says they want Nike to produce more of their limited print run shoes, but nobody actually means it. Tell yeah. me that and tell me how that applies to your philosophy around trading cards. Yeah, I mean, it, this gets back to, to, to transparency and, and hits and parallels, right? Um, you know, to reference back to the, the select conversation, um, I'm going to get the numbers slightly off here, but um, there were uh, something like 30, 31 or 32 Anthony Edwards 101s in select this year. And I think there were 17 or 18 um, uh, Zion Williams, um, one of ones, right? So going from, from one year to the next, the number of one of ones in that set, um, more than doubled or, or yeah. And, um, that's crazy. Right. Um, and so sure more people can pull a one of one and that's, that's exciting and that's great. Um, but the value of those cards starts to decline because there are too many out there. And so well, what do you want? Do, do consumers say, Hey, I put more one-of-ones in there because I, I want to hit them. Well, 
not really. What they really want is they want to be one of the lucky ones to hit the really valuable one of one, the, the logo man or the prism black, um, the ones that are, that are really valuable. And unfortunately, like to have them be very valuable, they have to be very scarce. So, you know, this is, this is the parallel um, issue across the board. Same thing with autographs and, and memorabilia hits, um, which is people say, or, or it would logically make sense that, hey, if we put more in there, then more people can hit them. And that's a good thing. It may not be, right? Um, what people really want is to be the lucky ones to hit that, that one of one, as opposed to hitting a one of one that is, that is not worth anything. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I feel like, I mean, to be quite honest, I feel like, the manufacturers right now are playing a little like rope a dope in the fact that they're, you know, they're trying to make you feel like, oh, I got this exclusive crazy card because you got this really rare parallel. Well, when there's 130 different parallels, then right. it's like, okay, great. That, yeah, that is a rare parallel, but, but how rare is getting a parallel then in general, right? right. So it's, and again, it, it comes back to transparency because we just don't fully know. We just don't fully know how many of these are out there. Um, we don't fully understand the print runs. And so I love, I love your thoughts and philosophy on all of that. All right, let's final question. A lot has been made about the fact that, um, you know, th there's been a lot of dealers. We've had dealers on this virtual holiday who have, you know, yeah, they're concerned about what is this fanatics direct to consumer, all this kind of stuff. And, and I know, again, you're not going to reveal fanatic specific plans here, but at the industry summit in Vegas, you, when you were on stage there, you spoke about the importance of card shops in the hobby and also the importance of kind of the experience that goes along with that. And you referenced it earlier in our conversation just a little while ago. What, what, why are card shops important to the ecosystem? And what do you want to see the card experience be like in the future? Well, I'll tell you what, because uh, he, he, he called me out the other day, right? Um, Rob Veris over at Burbank has done a phenomenal job of creating an experience over there. Um, I haven't been to the new location yet, but I've, I've seen it online and gotten tours. Uh, it's creating a place that people want to go to, right? We're in a post COVID internet world anyway, like physical experiences have gone, you know, whatever the numbers is, it's, it's way, way down. I leave my house significantly less than I used to. I buy more online. I buy I, stuff on eBay, but man, like I can still feel what it was like. I can smell what it was like going to a card shop when I was a kid with my father and, and, and the excitement of that and the excitement of walking into the store. Like I can, I can see the steps leading up to the card shop I used to go into. And, you know, that's why when I got back into the hobby in 2018, it was zero to a hundred, right? Because it brought back all back that excitement and that, and that, that, that memory. And look, card shows are, are phenomenal too. And I love the fact that there's more card shows that are happening, but you know, as I mentioned earlier, there needs to be 10 times as many hobby shops and they need to be palaces. They need to be museums. They need to be places where, you know, where, where kids want to go and, and, and spend time and, and hang out. Um, because you know, on the, the sneaker streetwear uh, side, that doesn't happen anymore. Right. And Sorry, not sorry, right? The, like StockX is, is partly responsible for that, but it's also because um, it, it's a much different it's a much different market. But trading cards can still be that because there's so many different things that you could be doing in there, whether you're collecting sets or whether you're breaking or whether you're you know uh, discussing cards to have graded or whether you're and there's there's just knowledge and and information that's needed to bring people into the hobby. There is friction. Of people coming into it there is a, a a disparity in knowledge it isn't easy for a new person kid or, or adult to come into the hobby and trading cards can be or excuse me hobby shops can be those those schools though those those bastions for people to come in there and do that so i i mean it's it's massively important and you know again like no promises no idea where we'll get to on this but i think that we should be supporting them by the way, and I think the other big organizations in the, the hobby should be supporting hobby shops as well. And not just with product, like that's the easy way to say, you know, you're, you're now in charge of, of product. You should give hobby shops more product. It's not that easy, but maybe there's marketing co-op dollars, or maybe there's, there's help with technology. Right. And last point on this, there's gotta be a way to have a, a better cadence of singles in hobby shops, right? Like they live and die by wax or supplies. And singles is tough because if it's graded and it's very easy to sell that stuff online, I get that. 
Um, but there's something there and I, and I don't know what it is because we haven't, you know, spent all that time there, but there's something there about like being able to walk in there and, and shop really interesting singles as well, which is by the way, why I love going to card shows more than card shops today, because I buy more singles than wax. But these are all the things like I'm, I'm so passionate about it. Like if I could recreate like that part of, of, of my childhood for everybody, this industry would be a hundred X of what it is. That is awesome. That is awesome. And I know in your, in your trading cards are cool. Again, you talked a lot about getting more people in and, but it has to be a frictionless experience. You said once it becomes frictionless, once the marketplace has become frictionless, the ability to buy and sell, the ability to understand what you're getting into, once it becomes frictionless, that's when more and more people come in. And, and of course, a rising tide rises all boats. I 100% completely agree with that fascinating stuff. So many nuggets in that trading cards are cool again report. For those of you out there who have not watched, not seen it, just Google trading cards are cool again. You're going to see an incredible, you know, philosophy, Josh's philosophy and thoughts on trading cards and an analysis of the recent market changes, all that kind of stuff. Josh, this has been wonderful. You have me excited about the future and I cannot wait to have you leading the helm and, and seeing, seeing all these things play out. So Josh, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words and thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Take care. Happy holidays. You too. I'm DJ Ski and I'm a passionate collector, sneakerhead, musician. People either know me for my work with artists like Lady Gaga to Kendrick Lamar, or they might know me for having an insane sneaker collection. ComplexCon is the center of all culture, all of these worlds where everything previously was segmented. You were a sneakerhead, you were into cards, and as we're seeing with this new generation, everything is just coming together and this is where it's all happening. When eBay asked me to display my sneakers, I knew that I had to come with something crazy. These 30 pairs are worth about $600,000. I actually got several of the pairs of the shoes in that display case from eBay. There's also a trading card vending machine that eBay has that I've slid some of my favorite cards in that I've created with them this year in um, that are long gone and selling for crazy amounts. You, you can get those absolutely free. It's definitely one of the coolest activations you'll see here at ComplexCon. I got passionate about trading cards as a kid instantly when I was always trying to upgrade and do more and more. This one might be my favorite looking card. It's inspired by when the Cubs won the World Series. And it's if you look at the original album cover that Kanye did, uh, it's just so much fun. And, um, that's why eBay's been such a great partner, because they've really given me this creative freedom to kind of do what I want. My personality has always been like obsessive on anything that I do. The advice that I have is find what's unique and what you like, because then you're going to be able to create your own money. If you're into something, go all in. It's how you have the most fun. All right, guys, it is the time of the night where we are going to give away, do our crazy box break to end the night, to end the virtual. Thank you for your patience during those interviews, but man, that was such good information from Josh Luber. I wanted to really get as much as I could from that interview he delivered. That was awesome. Thank you, Josh, for coming on the show, DJ Ski and Nat Turner. Thank you to everybody who commented in the new Hits app. So many people commented, I'm going to give away three prizes. First of all, QC, QSEE, -E, you've won a 2021 Topps Heritage Baseball High Number Hobby Box. Just came out. Congratulations, QSEE. -E. Eight, Rusi, and Lance Westcher. I'm sending both of you guys some stand-up displays, PSA, and top loader stands for your cards. Guys, this is a great prize. And those of you who didn't win stand-up displays, prizes, these stands are awesome to stand up your PSAs and your top loaders on your desk. And they're giving you 30% off, but that code is only valid, I believe, for the next couple of days. So 30% off with promo code SCI on any PSA stands or top loader stands or BGS stands or SGC stands or one-touch stands on standupdisplays.co. That's not .com, standupdisplays.co, but congratulations to our winners. And it is time now for the box break. We're going to break some incredible boxes. We, we don't yet have the boxes is the challenge. I need to check in with Holly Snowflake and figure out where the heck these boxes are. If we could, Kelly, if we could get Ke uh, Holly on here, please. I, Holly, Holly. I've been trying to ring her. She's not answering. Holly's not, Holly's not answering. Holly? Holly? 
We really need Holly on the phone. Somebody's knocking. I really need to get Holly. I need to know where these boxes. Yeah. Here. Wait. Oh. What? What? H Holly? You you come down to Atlanta, ladies and gentlemen. Holly Snowflake has just entered the studio. What? Ho I can't, I can't believe you're here, Holly, from the North Pole. Hey, Jeff. Are Are you okay? Oh, I'm, you, I'm just. I, I'm well. This you is know. this. Ah, you're you're freezing cold, Holly. This is a little bit. This is. Um, it's fine. We, it, you know, it's cool. It, it's a surprise that I'm here, ain't it? Um, but we had a bit of a snafu. No, no, we can't have a snafu, Holly. All of these people have been waiting for hours to get into these box breaks. What is this snafu? Um, well. Don't get your knickers in and twist, but Rudolph, he played a little too hard at that uh, soccer game, and he tore his ACL. Oh, I'm I so told him, sorry I said, don't you hog that ball. Yeah. I'm so sorry about yeah. Rudolph, Holly. That's I, awful. That's awful to hear, but these, they, they, I told him we were going to do a box break. To, I can't believe they're not going to get their boxes because Rudolph had a torn ACL. It's all right. I got them right here. Oh wait, you brought the boxes. I did. You brought the boxes personally you know, down from the North I Pole. I just, I just thought I would, cause you know Santa was like, Jeff has to get the boxes, so you got to get them to him. So I got them here for you. And oh, oh Holly, I got, Holly, I'm you're, Holly, snow Holly, you're, you're, you're snowing, Holly. You're, <laughs> I, you're sno I am. Well, I am Holly Snowflake. <laughs> you're, okay, okay, okay. Just living okay, up to the name. Okay, okay, Holly. Let me just go ahead and grab these yeah, boxes from you if you don't great. mind. Okay, that'd be you could. So, um, Holly, if you could give me the the oh, box, I'm trying. I'm sorry. The boxes, trying. Holly. Just try. Holly, hot. Okay, there we go. She's a little bit frozen, ain't she? <laughs> I think you're gonna need to get that checked out. That's you know you. that's a that's a good idea. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I I am so pleased that this show is gonna go on as planned, and we are. Let's see what we're gonna give out to the audience right now. We are gonna break a box of 2021 Black Diamond Marvel cards. We're gonna break a box of 2021 Topps Chrome Black. This just came out yesterday, I think. Amazing. Oh, oh, Holly, you brought us a box of 1996 Fleer Metal Series 2 Kobe Allen Iverson. Oh, wow, we got some big boxes we're about to break for these. Holly, thanks so much. Is there anything, is there anything we can do to help you out? Um. Have you got any hot cocoa? Oh, I do have some hot cocoa, actually. Yeah, I've got a fresh cup of hot cocoa Thanks, right Jeff. here. Yeah, let me give this to you. Holly? Holly? Uh, well, you know, let's do a box break, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully, Holly will be okay over there. I'm not so sure, but uh, we appreciate her efforts. We certainly appreciate these. Let's go ahead and get going with our countdown, and we will show you who won into tonight's box breaks. And there are the winners, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations. All the winners are listed on the screen for these box three box breaks tonight. And if you can't see your screen because it's too small, you can go see the winners right now by going to sportscardinvestor.com and clicking on virtual 2021 in the main menu bar. All of tonight's winners are listed on that page. Sportscardinvestor.com, virtual 2021 for tonight's winners. And uh, if you are a winner and you actually win any cards in the break, make sure to fill out the form on that page, sportscardinvestor.com, fill out the form on the virtual 2021 page. All right, let's go ahead and bring the boxes up. We're gonna start with this Topps Chrome black box. This is, gonna, this is a, uh, a box where we're going, um, a tea box. Oh, by the way, Teapot, welcome to the show, Teapot. Hey, Jeff. What's oh, going on? It, it's, it's a pleasure to have you join the virtual. You're very festive over there, sir. Yeah, I like this. This is uh, I'm feeling this. I might have to wear this more often. I, I mean, it, I tell you what, I do think it is your look. All right, so we've got this box of 2021 Topps Chrome. I believe, Teapot, this is, this is a new product. It's only four cards. Now, there are, there are 30 people in the break with different teams, so obviously not everybody is unfortunately going to get something. But the, uh, the four people who get something, I think they're going to be pretty happy. There are some incredible cards, and I believe you're guaranteed one encased chrome autograph and one refractor parallel per box. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, exactly that. You get a couple of base cards. Obviously, this rookie class is still unproven. People are still wondering what's going to happen with them, but there are a lot of noteworthy rookies, so I'm really excited to see what we're going to get. I'm really excited as well to see what we're going to get. Good luck, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully, you know what team 
you are on here. So we're going to start with a pack of three trading cards, and then we're going to look at that encased card last. All right, good luck, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pick your team break for people. Well, I guess one person could win multiple if it's, if it's their team multiple times. We shall see. Tops Chrome Black. All right. Anthony Rendon. Rendon. Anthony Rendon. We are starting with an Anthony Rendon Tops Chrome Black and Angels. a Clayton Hershaw. Clayton Congratulations, Hershaw. Dodgers. Los Angeles being represented here. That's right. We got a good LA. Rep these are, by the way, these are really, really, really cool cards. The design on these cards, like the, when you look at them in person, those are beauties. Okay, now we've got a refractor coming up, and our refractor is Garrett Cole Garrett of Cole. the New York Yankees. Yes. Refractor, let's see, that one is number two, 199. Really, really cool looking card, number to 199. Congratulations, Yankees. And let's go with All right. the big hit of the box. Oh boy, oh boy. Ooh. Oh boy, we got a good one. Oh, we man. got a good one, Teapot. Oh, man. We got a good one, audience. We got a hit coming your way. We got a big player, audience. We got a Juan Soto. Whoa. Look at that, a beautiful Juan Soto card. Oh, man. Beautiful Juan oh, Soto man. auto card. I believe that is an on-card auto Juan Soto. Tops Chrome Black, number to 99. Wow. Absolutely beautiful card. Congratulations to the Washington Nationals. Nice. You just hit a big time card. Wow. Wow. Awesome. What a hit. Wow. I'm, I feel like I need to, you know, imitate our friends at Mojo. Like, boom, 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 boom. boom. You know, over and over. This boom. Is, there you go. It. That's great. Congratulations. All right. We just pulled some fire to start this break, ladies and gentlemen. Let's keep this awesome. fire going. Now, Teapot, I know you're a big Marvel fan. This is the 2021 Black Diamond. And so any winners in this, this is not obviously pick your team or I don't even know what it would be. Pick your character. Pick it is. Character. It is not that everybody. Everybody just gets one card. Got it. Okay. So, so we're gonna we do five, the cards in order on this one. Yeah, five five cards per box. Um, I think you're gonna get a, a sketch card or an autograph or uh, I forget what they call the other one. Some kind of diamond diamond card, but. Uh, I think six chase, cards, one exquisite collection, and Got then it. five black diamonds. Right so on. six cards total. Yep. Okay. Awesome. And obviously, you know, you're looking for Spider-Man. Spider-Man's the biggest, and then Thor. Uh, you know, Black Panther, Iron Man, uh, Captain America, those are all going to, you know, be really popular too. Okay. I've never opened this product before. This one's kind of a, like a boomer bust. There are some really nice cards in this. Um, all of them look awesome. And thank you to our friends at eBay for supplying all of these boxes. These are all from our friends at eBay. Awesome of them to supply all of this and to be such a wonderful sponsor, allowing us to put all of this together. That's a good one. It is. It is Captain Marvel. Brie Larson as Captain Marvel, and that is numbered to 149. Number to 149, number 22 of 149. So that is the first card. Back up a little bit. My hat is obstructing, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. There you go. Number to 149, second card. Ooh, that's cool. Look at that. That is Scarlett Johannesson as the Black Widow. Nice. Very cool. That's neat. That's like some sort of kind of cool. Yeah, it's got like that little, little stained film, glass effect stained on that one. Cool. The third card is an autograph. That's the auto. Peggy Carter. Haley Atwell as Peggy Carter, number to 65. From obviously the Captain America, from Captain America movies and show. There you go. Awesome. This is pretty cool here. Now we got a patch, polished patches. Brie Larson as Carol Danvers. Captain Marvel. That's a cool patch. Big patch. All right. A lot of women here. Ooh, we got a big one coming. We got a big one coming, Teapot. Whoever's in the five spot. Whoever's in the five spot. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a Thor. Ooh, nice. We've got a Thor patch card, black diamond, diamond shards, dual relic, nice. Thor and Hela. That's pretty sweet. Look at that. A dual relic card involving Thor. One is certainly one of the big characters in the box. One of my favorite Marvel movies, Thor Ragnarok. Absolutely hilarious. It's more like a comedy, honestly. So check it out if you haven't. There you go. And we're down to our final card. And this is number to 23. It's a, not, it's a good one here. It's number to 23. Oh, that's going to be really nice. And there we go. We got Captain Marvel, Exquisite Collection, nice. Brie Larson as Captain Marvel, Number to 23. Nice. Awesome. That is the sixth card. 
Very cool. Very cool. Congratulations. I'll put these back in order. That was a Captain Marvel hot box. There you go. That my was a Josh, Captain. Uh, my buddy Josh would be jealous. He's that was a Captain, Captain Marvel, Marvel hot box. All right. And now we are down teapot to the final box of the evening, the final box wow. of the virtual. And this box, sir, is no small one. Tell the audience what this is. Yeah. 1996-97 Series 2 Skybox Metal Hobby. Uh, obviously, 1996, one of the absolute best rookie classes of all time in basketball, headlined, of course, by Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson, Stephon Marbury, Steve Nash, Ray Allen, among many, many, many others. Derek Fisher, obviously, one of the you know winningest players in history. So um, we've got a lot of chase cards in this. We got the precious metals. So not to be confused with the precious metal gems. I actually just did an episode on this recently on our channel. Precious metals are those really like silver finished cards. One in 36 packs. So you've got 24 packs in this box, Jeff. And that means about one in every one and a half boxes will hit one of those precious metals. So what you're going to be looking for is if you see the background and it's not colored like the rest of them are, they're really subtle. I'll help you catch one if we, uh, if we hit one. Okay. And then you can also get from these, I believe, the uh, minted metals, bronze, silver, gold, and the rare 18 karat gold hobby exclusive one in 720 packs. Yeah, there's some big hits. Uh, you've also got uh, cyber metals at one in six. That's just going to be Ray Allen, really, the chase card. Freshly forged at one in 24, really cool cards. And then I would really love to see us hit a platinum portraits. Those are one in 96 or one in every four boxes. Awesome checklist. Those are those kind of um, impressionist metal looking ones where they form the picture of the silhouette of the, the head of the player. Um, awesome cards. And then Net Rageous at one in 288. Yeah, really big hit. So, wow. Lot to, lot to potentially hit in this box. Wow. All right. Here we go. Whoever's got the uh, Lakers and whoever's got the Sixers, they would be two great teams to have in this break. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Or the Bulls. Oh, we're the Bulls. We're the Bulls indeed. Absolutely. So this is metalized. Yeah, is metalized. that anything? It's just uh, part of the base checklist. It's kind okay. of an in checklist uh, insert. Still a cool looking card. Yeah. That's an Akeem Olajuwon metalized yeah. there. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All you right. get the metal shredders out of these too, which are really cool cards. Okay. And there is a metal shredders. Yeah. Now awesome. that you said that. Okay. Chris there Weber are, metal shredders. There's a Jordan metal shredder. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Okay. We will keep an eye out for that indeed. Okay. So I, uh, I think those were all standard there and you see how you can see sort of like the burned metal look in the background with the color yeah if you don't see that if it's just all silver that means it's a precious metal okay it's wow the only indication that's, on the card that's uh that's, i will keep an eye out for that for sure oh you know what we got a minted metal coming up you said the minted metals were good right the minted metals let's see what let, let's see what it is oh it's a good one we got a good minted metal coming up. Okay, let's you see. You said it. the minted metals are rare, let's right? See it. I mean, that's that's what you read off the box, right? So oh, it is. Oh, is that what yeah. I read off? The, oh, yeah. yes, the minted metals is it are the rare. Or is it yes, a, uh, look for look for minted metal mint. Look, yeah, I don't know. Featuring. Oh, they're only featuring Grand Hill and Jerry Stockhouse. So I just I just gave okay. you a clue as All to right. what's about to come. I just gave you a clue. Here we go, ladies let's and gentlemen. Go. Here we go. We have got a minted metal bronze wow, redemption yeah. card. Yeah. Redemption card. That's so the minted, I, the minted metals were redemption cards. Well, you could still grade it, right? You could still grade you could it. Still grade it. You could still grade know. it. And honestly, that's probably an extremely low pop card because if anybody pulled that out, they would have almost certainly sent that in because these were very, very rare cards, difficult to find. Does that say? Is it bronze or what did you this say? This is bronze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the Fleer Metal NBA Two Minted Metal Redemption card. Okay. You send that in for the stack house. All right. And then we have a Grand Hill. A Grand Speaking Hill, of right Grand Hill, there. there you go. And uh, a metalized Spreewell. Nice. I also passed a Rashid Wallace earlier too. And a Cycli. All right, sticking together a little bit here. Oh, Stefan Marbury. Stephon Marbury, nice. There you go. Very cool. And Man. he was popular in the 90s. He was awesome. Yeah, no, he it? definitely you was. Got, oh, you got another one stuck there, too. Yeah. Yep. And Rodney Rogers. Okay. Yeah, these ones will stick a little bit. This doesn't actually seem to be too bad. I've seen some pretty bad bricking on this product in the past, but um, they will stick a little bit if you give them a little bit of a bend when you open them. They pull apart nicely. Oh, we got a good card on the back. All right. P.J. Brown, Brown, Kendall Gill, John Wallace, Samakai Walker, 
Sam Cassell. Scotty Pippen, ladies and gentlemen, metalized, a metalized Scotty Pippen. Cool. Cool card. Pretty, like, they're pretty common. As you've yeah, seen cool card before. though. And then Travis Best, and then hey, we've got Ray nice. Allen. Nice. There you go. Very nice. Very nice Ray Allen card. Congratulations yeah. to the Bucks. Yeah, one of the three or four best, uh, you know, rookies to pull out of this. For sure. Congratulations to the Bucks on the Ray Allen rookie card. Excellent, excellent card. All right. <clears throat> All right, this is classic 90s basketball right here, Teapot. I know yeah. this was your, your collecting era. This was my heyday. This is pure nostalgia. I always love seeing 96 product get opened. All right. Sean Kemp. Sean Kemp, Metal Shredders, right, Isaiah guy. Ryder. Guy who could dunk, man, he was a freak. Let's see what we got here. There's another Kendall Gill. Oh, oh this is interesting. Yeah. Fresh Foundations, yeah. Allen Iverson. Yeah. Very nice hit. Very really nice good. Hit. Those are uh, those are uh, Fresh Foundations. Why did I not write that down? That's a nice hit. That's as a big hit. That's a nice hit. That's nice. Yeah. Fresh yeah. Foundations. That's a really, really cool looking yeah. card. Take I don't know how well the camera's one. picking up like how cool that card actually looks. Yeah, they're sharp. Take good care of that. That is awesome. Congratulations, Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah, oh, is he going on? Our, he's an Iverson guy. Our, our so eBay uh, team is here. Chris so Tani from eBay is super excited about the Allen Iverson uh -huh. Fresh Foundations. Yeah. That's a fantastic card. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Abdul, Abdul Ralph, he was, uh, oh no, actually, was it Abdul, Abdul, yeah. it was, uh, Abdul Rahim was the rookie, right? Oh, Sharif Abdul Rahim. Sh yeah, 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 not, yeah. Not a, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. And a Mitch yeah. Richmond medal. I had shows. a huge Sharif PC. Still do, right. actually. He was one of my guys. Yeah, he was he was a 96 rookie. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He was an awesome player that unfortunately got drafted by the Grizzlies when they were in Vancouver, and it just kind of fizzled his career out. All right. We got a Metal Shredders, Gary Payton. My other PC. We've got a Shandon Anderson. Might have a big card. Oh, well, I don't know. Might just be. Well, we got a checklist, checklist. Oh, but behind man. the checklist, we got an upside down card. What does that mean? I don't know. It means a cyber metal. Vin Baker. What is a cyber is metal? That, that's a that's an insert. Uh, one in six. One in six yeah, packs. One in six. Okay. So nothing crazy. Nothing there. crazy, nothing but, crazy still but still kind of a neat card, card there. Okay, right after the checklist yep. card. All right. Anthony Mason. Anthony Mason. Sam Cassell. And another Scotty Pippen. Another All Scottie right. Pippen. Oh. I remember, is that does that one have the color? Travis the Anthony Best. Mason. Does the Anthony Can Mason have, have the, the color? color? I can't quite see it as well from here on this. Yeah, screen. it has the color. It does. It okay. has the color background. Right. Yeah. So I'm looking. I'm continuing to look for any that don't have the color background. Nice. All right. If anyone out there opened 1996 medal when it came out, let us know in the chat. If you are an OG, if you opened this product when it came out, let us know. Got another checklist card to start off here. All Did right, you? Kevin Garnett. There you go. Yep. Metal eyes, Kevin Garnett. Cool. Yep. Love that one. Make sure I'm going through all the cards here. Yeah. All right, Dale Ellis. Another Hakeem. Metal eyes. Another Ray Allen. Very nice. Congratulations, Bucks. Hey. Another hey. Fresh Foundations, hey. Allen Iverson. Another pack. Fresh Foundations, Allen Iverson. Nice pack. Congratulations, 76ers. You're doing good so far for sure. Yeah. Another Abdul Ralph and another Mitch Richmond. Awesome. In fact, <clears throat> number of duplicate cards there. And believe it or not, this was not a very popular product back in the 90s when it first you know, came out. It came out in 95, and uh, it wasn't the most popular product, but obviously it's, it's really, really blossomed over time. I just heard, the, I just heard our team out there scream when they <laughs> saw the recording of the other, of the other Allen Iverson. That's funny. So not pop, not popular when it came out, but has gained a following yeah. over the years. I loved it. I mean, I loved it when it came out. I, I was all about this product, but uh, unfortunately wasn't savvy enough to pick up some of the big hits back then. Right. We had a Sir Charles Barkley and a David Robinson in that pack. Very cool. Now some of these, if you can get them to gem in a PSA 10, mm -hmm. they're pretty low population. Uh, they'll, some of these will go for, for bigger money in, in you know, the PSA 10s. Well, I mean, these are pack fresh and they look good. I mean, they look, they look nice. So obviously a lot, a lot of uh, Todd Fuller Fresh Foundations. Yep. 
All right, we got some type of insert here, perhaps. A freshly forged. Yeah, freshly forged. Antoine Walker. One in 24 packs. Okay. Doug, Doug would like that one a lot. Obviously, the UK guy, Antoine Walker, yeah. was a really solid player. Yeah, cool. Fresh Foundations, Kerry Kittles. All right. <clears throat> nice. Haven't seen a Jordan yet. Haven't seen a Kobe yet. They're coming. No, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming, baby. Teapot just declared. They're coming. Yep. There we go. I think, I think the Jordan uh, is, is only, maybe only the Metal Shredders in Series 2. His base card might have been Series 1. Okay. Um, There's Abdul Rahim, rookie. Yep. Sharif Abdul Rahim. Yeah. Yep. Glenn Robinson, Shredders. Another Sharif. Another Sharif. Congratulations to Sharif Abdul Rahim rookies in the same pack. There you go. I'm going to keep an eye to make sure I'm not missing any of the rare parallels along the way. Yeah, this card does. these cards do have a cool design. I see why you were a fan of them when they came out. Maybe got like the raised lettering on them. You know, it was a really cool... Uh, mm -hmm. Innovative product. Oh, there we go, oh, ladies hey. and gentlemen. Right off the top, ladies and gentlemen, let's go. Yeah. Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant right. has joined the party. A Kobe Bryant rookie card yeah. from Fleer Metal 96. Congratulations. Nice. Gotta sleeve that up. Awesome. Sleeve we will, oh yeah. These are these are we're gonna sleeve many of these up. Many of these are gonna be sleeved up for Beautiful. sure. In fact, if we could get careful. Parker in here, we will start sleeving now. Yeah. Yeah, be Gotta careful. be very careful here. Pulling the one off the back of that. Yeah. Congrats to the Lakers spot. It's an awesome card. Awesome card. There we go. Got that one off carefully. Let me hand that nice. over. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, look at this. We got sleeves right here. So I can go ahead and sleeve that one up as we go. Awesome. Fantastic. Very nice. All right. Tyrone Corbin. We have a Cyber Metal Charles Barkley. Byron Russell. All right, these are all packed fresh. I hope whoever got that Kobe grades that and gets a solid grade. Yeah. You definitely have the opportunity what was that? to do so. David Robinson. It was a David Robinson metalized. It does have the color on it? It's too. got the color, okay. yeah. It does. Thanks, Parker. I actually just grabbed some here, so we're good. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Let's All go. Right. Let's get some more. Let's see another Kobe. You see another Kobe? I, know, I, I said, let's see. Oh, another. let's see another Kobe. I mean, hey, I can will it into existence, maybe. There we go. Vernon Maxwell. I'm still rooting for that platinum portraits. Vernon Maxwell, ladies and gentlemen. You know where Vernon Maxwell went to college, Teapot? Uh, I can guess. You can guess it, just by the it, nature of the question. You can guess, nah, can't nah, nah, you? Nah, nah, nah. It does start with na, 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 na. That is a good guess. That is a good guess. All right. Better sleeve that Maxwell up. <clears throat> Sle oh, yeah, sleeve the Vernon Maxwell up. <laughs> maybe whoever got the Rockets. He was on the Rockets then, right? He was, yeah. Yeah, maybe whoever got the Rockets will, uh, he was. will trade me for their Vernon Maxwell card. All right, Dikembe <laughs> Mutombo. Look at that. Steve Kerr seeing some new names in this pack that we haven't seen before. Metalized, Carl, Carl Malone metalized, Malone. Stoudemire. Yeah, Stoudemire. Yep. Mighty Mouse. Yeah. Another Sharif. Yeah, Sharif rookie, another one of those. Through up to three Sharif rookies now, only yeah. one Kobe rookie, Still no right. Jordans. Still time. Ooh, a Dennis Rodman, though. Yep. Nice. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Dennis Rodman metalized. So, speaking of, of Damon Stoudemire, the, the Platinum Portraits checklist is basically. He's the only guy you don't want to get in terms of value. He doesn't carry a ton of value. The rest of the checklist is like all the best players. Interesting. So if we get one of those portraits, we're probably going to be pretty happy. Yeah, the Jordans go for a, a nice chunk of change. Gary Payton. Rashid Wallace. Rashid. Yeah. All right. What's your favorite part of the virtual teapot? You've been able to sit back there and watch it the last couple of nights. Oh, I like the uh, this is uh, sports card investor <laughs> commercials that our team came up with. Those, Those were fun, weren't watching they? Watching them over and over, making you laugh. Our team has boundless creativity. Yeah, boundless yeah. creativity. 
the interviews with Nat and Josh were great. Yeah, those were great today. Yep. Those are really great. Robert Ori. Ron Harper. Okay, we got a freshly forged Sharif Abdul Rahim. Cool. Yeah, nice. So kind of beat the odds on that. Yeah, that's Those a good are one. Those are one in twenty-four, and we've hit two of them. Yeah, that's I don't know a good, what that says that's a pretty for good one to hit. To, to hit something else, but uh, that's nice. Yeah, very cool. Jalen Rose, Drew Lang, Carrie Kittles. Carrie Kittles. Oh, oh, Allen hey, Iverson. Nice. There we go. All we got right. an Allen Iverson right. rookie right. too. So we've got two of the Allen Iverson. Yeah. Uh, fresh, whether they're, they're called freshly minted freshly and forged. freshly for no yeah. fresh foundations, fresh foundation. Allen Iverson. Yeah. And then we got one of these Allen Iverson rookies as well. Right. There you go. Look at you. Whoever's got the Philadelphia 76ers is uh, pretty happy with themselves right now. I was hoping you keep those cards away from Chris. <laughs> yes. Our friend from eBay who's here in the studio, Chris is a big Allen Iverson guy, AI. So he is, uh, he picked this box out. So he picked it out right. He definitely picked it out right. Got some good AI buzz is it there. Steve Nash. Oh, that's right. Steve, Steve Nash. Steve Nash, rookie card. Steve Nash, 1996. Yeah. All right, let's go. Awesome. Very cool. Jawan Howard. Marcus Mark Candy, rookie. Yeah. Well, He's a guy who doesn't get enough, uh, doesn't get enough love. Great. Value over replacement numbers was a heck of a player, but big player in college too. Yeah, not a just not a popular name. Yeah, he was a guy who helped me win a lot of fantasy basketball leagues. Wow, look at that! All right, how many more packs do we have left? Oh, I don't know. About maybe about a little under ten, maybe around. All right. Around 10 or so, a little less. We've still got that Jordan coming. Yeah, we've still got time. We've still got room for the Jordan Kobe. coming. Checklist card. Checklist. Kobe. The checklist card. Double checklist in that pack. What does that mean? Gary Payton medalized. Samuel Walker. Dennis Rodman again. Jalen Rose. Andrew Payton. Lang. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. What else we got here? Dominique Wilkins. Yeah, with the Spurs. Wait a minute. Yeah, that is a Spurs Dominique yep. Wilkins. Wow, yep. look at that. Yep. Antoine, Antoine Walker. Walker. Robert Parrish. Does that one Parrish. have the color on it? The Walker did? Yeah. It's got a little color on okay. it. Okay. Yeah, these are hard to see. you got to kind of catch them it's in the light. from from the, this angle. Yeah, right yeah, there. yeah. Mm -hmm. Grant Hill. Sprewell. Rogers, Marbury. Nice. There you go. Nice. I do have a Grant Hill precious metal in my PC. It's one of my favorite Grant Hill cards. Very cool. What, uh, what, oh, so uh, you, from this year, from, from this, this set, set you yeah, got one of them. Yeah, PSA 9. Wow, very neat. Yeah. Alonzo, Alonzo Morning. Shaq. There's a Shaq. Hey, there you go. Give Shaq a little top loader love. It's pretty sweet. Jalen Rose. Fresh Foundations, Roy Rogers. Cedric Sabalas. Uber Davis. Damon Stoudemire. All right. So we are five, I think about five packs here right, to go, right. Teapot. Right, we got to find our big. Jordan. We got to find let's our Jordan. Something big. Marcus Canby, Fresh Foundations, pretty sweet. Nice. Okay. Larry Johnson. Anderson, Isaiah Ryder. All right. All right, Jerry Stackhouse. All right, Teapot, let's go. Okay. Let's get this Jordan, man. Let's go. Or hit another Kobe. Or hit a rare insert. Or all of the above. All of the above. Kevin Garnett. Dale Ellis. Kobe Bryant, ladies Kobe. and gentlemen, making a return for the second time this Very evening, nice. second time in the box. Very nice. Kobe Bryant, ladies and gentlemen, the Lakers spot is rejoicing. Send those off for grading. 
Yeah. Definitely want to see what you get there. Glenn Robinson, Kerry yeah. Kittles. Allen Iverson, Ooh, ladies and gentlemen. Man. 76ers spot is on a roll. Four Allen Iverson rookie cards so far in this box. Congratulations. If you have the 76ers, make some noise in the chat. Marcus Camby rookie card. We're on a roll now, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go. Make some noise in the chat if you have the Sixers or if you have the Lakers because you have done well for yourself this evening. Congratulations. Congratulations. The bull spot is still holding their breath. The bull spot is on the edge of their seat. Now, we did hit a Dennis Rodman. We hit a couple of Scottie Pippins. But, of course, the one you want to hit, we have not hit yet. That's true. All right. There was a break recently on YouTube of this product. Ten loose packs, and they hit four Jordan metal shredders. What? Four in ten packs. In ten packs? Yeah, and two Kobe's. That's insane. Crazy. Really? Yep, totally crazy. Those are good packs. Yeah. Maybe that's why we're not getting any. Yeah, they took all the good ones. All right, three packs left, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Three packs left. Let's get this done. Let's get this done. All right, here we go. Penny. Anthony Hardaway. Vernon Maxwell. That's a good sign. <laughs> That's a good sign. Matumbo. Ooh. Cyber Metal Joe Smith. Oh, nice. There we go. All right. Donnie Rogers. Stefan Marbury. Marbury. Fresh Foundations. And a Sabalis. Cedric. All right. Two packs left, Teapot. Right. Two packs left. What do you think? All right. I think we've had some really good success opening 90 stuff with last pack mojo. Last Actually, card that's true. We mojo. Have. We have. We've had last card mojo. Yeah, we watched Kelly pull the upset on we did. all of us. Oh my gosh, that was wild. One of our earlier videos on the channel. All right, Steve Kerr, Carl Malone, Mark Jackson, Vlade Divac, Hubert yeah. Davis. Hubert Davis. Damon Stoudemire, I feel like a mm -hmm. card is stuck. Let's get something behind this. Something big. Trace Murray. Mm -hmm. Didn't meet your definition. T no. Did not meet your definition. Kevin Lewis, who's that? All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get some applause in the studio. It's the last let's pack. Go. People are on their feet. We are ready to go, ladies and gentlemen. We are ready to go. It is the last pack. Let's go. All right. Let's go. Robert Ori on top. And I'm just going to show you who's on the bottom because we already saw that one a little bit. So that won't count as the last card. Ron Harper, so we got a bull, not the one we were looking for. Portraits. Alan Houston, we got a one we can flip over here and that's gonna be a Latrell Spreewell Cyber Metal. Cyber Metal. Followed by a Lindsey Hunter, followed by a Stack. Stack, and then the last card in the pack is. Let's go. All right. That? Lorenzen Wright. Lorenzen Wright. Wright. All right. Well, hey, that All was right. still a fun break nonetheless. Hit awesome. a bunch of Iversons, hit a bunch of Kobe's. You could not go wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of that. Thank you so much for being part of the virtual. It's been absolutely incredible. We've had just absolutely amazing, amazing guests on for the last few days. Uh, and in fact, somewhere I think I have a list of said guests. Um, but I'm just going to, I can just, free, just freewheel it otherwise and just say thank you to the fact that we've just had such amazing people. Thank you to you, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of the show, for watching, for supporting, for subscribing. We really, you really, really helped make this possible. Thank you to eBay, because eBay did a fabulous job of stepping up to the plate and uh, uh, delivering so many great boxes and everything. Oh, and look at this. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to Bob Means from eBay, Josh Luber, Steve Aoki, Nat Turner, DJ Ski, Mike Waddell, Darren Rovell, Rick Probstein, Vintage Magic, Panini, GTS Distribution, Card Kids, Show Your Slabs, Stand Up Displays, Slab Strong, Got Baseball Cards, D's Cards, Mealy Pops, Black Jaded Wolf, Bleaker Trading, Card Collector 2, Burbank Sports Cards, Awesome Sports, Miss Sports Cards, Comeback Card Investor, Women of the Hobby, Bench Clear Media, Basketball Card Fanatic, Laden Sports Cards, Dynasty Breaks, Mojo Break, Jaspies, Titan Cards, Top Shelf Breaks, Don Diego Trading, Loot Box, Mojo Sports, Moneyball Cards, Daps, and of course for the box donations, Tops and Panini and eBay. eBay, our title sponsor who did so many great things for this show. What a lineup of people. That was incredible. 
But ladies and gentlemen, there's one last group I need to thank, and it is our team here at Sports Card Investor because none of this would have been possible without the incredible work by so many on our team. Our video team, leading our video team, Charles, Charles Hurley, absolutely amazing, and his team, Phil and Tim, did an outstanding job of putting all of this together. Congratulations to you guys. Uh, brand marketing and social, Ben, Adam, and DeMarco, absolutely outstanding. Congrats there out there, congrats. Uh, community management, Hammer and Doug. We had design from Steven and Anthony. We had product prep and data to get the new sports card investor app launch going strong for, from Teapot, Parker, and Leon. Of course, our North Pole updates, Holly the Snowflake, Caitlin, the Hits app, the Hits app, ladies and gentlemen, that we brought together and launched this week, Aaron King, Nick, Zach, tremendous job by them uh, contributing to that. Kelly, uh, well, Kelly, and we got it, we got it. So many people to thank, so many people to thank, but the one who worked absolutely tirelessly, tirelessly, tirelessly for the last for the last many, many months to put this show together. Has spent weekends here, has spent nights here, and a lot of our team has. But Kelly has gone above and beyond. She is the one that, that from the day one started putting all of this together and, and worked incredibly hard to make all of this happen. Kelly, come on up here. We gotta get you up here. We gotta get you up here, Kelly. Kelly, I told <laughs> Kelly I was gonna get her a, a good bottle of wine when she got done. I decided, Kelly worked so hard, I decided you needed a double-sized bottle of wine, Kelly. This is from my favorite winemaker, Orrin Swift. That is yes. a short print Orrin Swift wine bottle. Wow. Uh, a double, I figure that, I mean, you know. You, good enough for one For one, for you know, one evening at home. Yeah. One oh evening God. at home. Congre Kelly, oh you're outstanding. Thank you did a you. fantastic job. Thank you so much. Everybody in the chat, give her virtual hand applause emojis because she truly, truly deserves it. Thank you. Thank you for joining. We appreciate you being part of this. And I cannot wait to do the virtual next year. Until then, we're going to sign off. Thank you again to eBay. And we'll see you next year. Happy holidays and happy new year, everybody. See you again soon.